Saints, welcome, welcome, welcome to Kingdom Seekers of Yahuwah. Hallelujah. We are live, live, live. I'm sorry, I'm two minutes late. <sighs> Just some weird things were happening before I started. I have to try to now upload my slides into StreamYard because I emailed myself my slides today at about two. Now, as I'm ready to come on live about 50 minutes before, can't see the email. Tried sending myself the slides again. It's showing sent, not coming through in my email because I did it on one laptop. I'm not, I'm, I emailed it to myself so I can open it on another laptop. Did it a third time, still won't come through. So we just said a quick prayer. <sighs> craziness, some real, real craziness. So um, just bear with me. Come, come and join us live. We are going to be talking about a very, very hot hot topic tonight just give me a minute i will try to download my slides quickly and upload it into Streamyards. hopefully i shouldn't have any problems normally i would have done all this before but like i said just some difficulties i'm not sure what was going on my slides just wouldn't arrive in my email so i'm doing that right now as we're speaking yeah great we're getting that in All right, so I'm very, very excited also about our Sabbath message tomorrow. We have a very, very important Sabbath, Sabbath message tomorrow. And I want to encourage every believer to, to watch it. Uh, I'm trying to upload it now. I'm so sorry, saints. I normally have everything ready before. But I had technical difficulties before I started. It was really bad. Really, really bad. But we're going to put tonight's session in the hands of Yahuwah. He's our Elohim. He's our guide. So we're definitely going to put everything we do tonight. We're going to cover the airwaves tonight. Because four attempts, four attempts so that my slides wouldn't arrive. Four attempts. For whatever reason. But we're going to cover the airwaves tonight. Awesome. Great. Let me just get the Sefer open now. There we go. Right. Awesome. So, Saints, I want to welcome you, Sister Melissa here. Welcome to Kingdom Talk, episode 25. Can you believe it? Episode 25 of Kingdom Talk. Talk. I'm so excited. Really, really excited. We are going to examine the rapture doctrine. We are going to examine the rapture doctrine. So, if you're joining me live, say hi. Let me know where you're joining from. Greetings to you. Greetings, blessings, and shalom to all of you. I'm going to dive right in tonight, but before I do so, I want to cover the airwaves because I had a lot of challenges getting on tonight, so I'm going to cover the airwaves. Just a very, very quick prayer. Oh, glorious Elohim, Father, we come to you in the name of your son, Yahushua HaMashiach, and we want to thank you for this very moment that you've given us. We want to thank you for the life that is in our veins, oh, Father. We want to thank you for the life in our body, oh, Elohim. We want to thank you for the soundness of mind and the shalom that you have blessed us with, O oh Father, and by which we have access through Yahushua HaMashiach. Father, we want to cover the airwaves tonight, O oh Father, and pray for your divine protection on what is being done tonight. We pray, Father, that you will bless the listeners that will be listening, that you will give them an ear to hear and a heart to understand. We pray, Father, that you would use me, O oh Father, that I will be a vessel, an instrument, O oh Father, fitted for your good work. And all this is done, O oh Elohim, for the glory of your kingdom. For your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endure forever. And we want to thank you, O oh Elohim, for transporting us out of darkness into the kingdom of your marvelous light, into the kingdom of your son. And we give all glory and reverence to your holy name. For Yahuwah Sevaot, Yahuwah alone is the only true and living Elohim who is worthy to be praised forever and forever. Amen and amen. 
right so we are going to be examining the rapture doctrine tonight and i'm going to i'm going to start with a confession let me see if i can get my mouse to work lots of things were just giving lots of troubles before i came on so um i'll start with a confession since last week i announced after our live last week that this is what we were going to be dealing with this week and i went into bible study went into prayer seeking the heavenly father on this and i could not come up with the presentation i struggled to come up with the presentation i knew i know what the doctrine is but i struggled as to how to put this together and you know later on it was this wasn't until this morning so i had done some of it already but not just the rough the research part that you would soon see but um i had all the scriptures i had so much that i had studied but i didn't know how to put this together and it wasn't until this morning i went before yahuwah and i prayed and i asked him for his guidance by his ruach hakadesh to put this together you know for me to bring this to work for the saints and for the sisters to be enlightened hallelujah and um, you know what Yahuwah revealed to me? My focus, we, our intent is very important. What our intent is when we come to Yahuwah is very important. And when you're do, doing your Bible study as well, it's very important what your intent is in your heart. Because my intent was, you know, the, the, the Unmasking Satan series, it was really deep. And we went on for one session was like two to three hours long. So in my mind, I was like, how could I say all this in one hour? And my intent in terms of cutting down and trying to present it in an hour prohibited me from being able to allow the Ruach to just work in me and let the Ruach just guide me, right? And I think that is why I struggled. And this morning, after I prayed this morning and I asked, I told you who I needed his guidance to finally put these slides together and to forget the length of the slides and to forget how long it will take, even if we have to do this in two parts, but allow his Ruach to work in me, it just all came instantly. Everything came instantly. So I give all the glory, all the honor and praise to Yahuwah Sevaot. I give all the honor and praise to him who heareth prayer. Oh, he that heareth prayer unto him shall all flesh come. So we're gonna dive right into this. We are going to examine the rapture doctrine. And I want us to start off with a short clip. So I used to believe in the rapture doctrine. And I don't want anyone, if you believe in it, please don't run away as yet. Because sit with me, go through this Bible study with me. Because in this Bible study, we are going to go through this doctrine based on scriptures. So I just want to encourage everyone who has come tonight, or if you fall on the replay of this video, so watch this video till the end and don't just comment because you see the title and just share your comment, but rather watch it and go through the script. We balance longing for that day. Sorry. Right. So we're going to watch a short clip to start off with. I'll have to see if I can start this back. I have to live for Christ. Balance longing for that day with the call we have to live for Christ today. You know, for me, I'm looking forward to going to heaven, but in the meantime, I'm looking forward to living my life. Yeah. There's, I love this story about a little boy who was in a class one day, and the teacher said, how many of you want to go to heaven? And everybody in the class raised their hand but this little boy. And the teacher walked back, and she said, Johnny, don't you want to go to heaven when you die? He said, oh, yes, ma'am, when I die, but I thought you were getting up a load for tonight. <laughs> You know, that's how I feel. You know, I want to go to heaven when the right time comes. But you know what? You can be so heavenly minded, you're no earthly good. A mind-blowing revelation by none other than the billionaire Elon Musk. Elon Musk, the visionary entrepreneur, has just confirmed something that will leave you astonished. So join us as we dive into this eye-opening video to explore what he has to say about the rapture and why it's going to happen very soon. Yes, I hope that you enjoyed that clip. And this clip is just an echo. When you, when you do a YouTube search or you do a Google search, you see the millions, the millions of videos about we're going to be raptured out of here. And this clip is just an echo. And I, put, I point no fingers at any of the shepherds out there, but I state the facts because I was in this. 
And we have a, 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 a big named pastor who is talking about going to heaven, who is talking about living his life, bearing in mind that once we've come into this faith, it's no longer our life. It's not about ourselves anymore. We've actually traded our life. Hallelujah. And he talks about you mustn't be too heavenly minded so you know earthly good. We have to be careful of those sayings of the world. And I want to start off on that foundation. We are set apart people, right? There is no such thing as being too heavenly minded that you know earthly good. Because what are we as set apart people asked to do? We are asked by the scriptures, instructed by the scriptures to walk in the spirit so that we do not fulfill the lust of the flesh. What are we instructed by the scriptures is to set our affections on things above, on heavenly things. So if we set our affections on heavenly things, it means we are heavenly minded. The kingdom of heaven is within us. The kingdom that we are part of is in heaven right now and within us. We are heavenly minded. So we have them out there saying some of these worldly sayings that may sound good but they're not scripturally correct. And tonight, I want to encourage everybody to stick with me to the end because this is going to get deep tonight. And we're going to examine this rapture doctrine according to scripture. And to start with, I want to encourage us, including myself always, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. One of the things I've learned with Bible study, and I've shared this with, with you all since before, when you come and you engage in Bible study, you've got to forget your programming. You've got to be in a state of where you totally allow the Ruach HaKadosh to guide you, the Holy Spirit to be your guide. You have to lay it all down. And that is what true submission is. This is what I believe. This is what I think is right. But is this what scripture is saying? And then you go and you ask Yahuwah and you ask him, Father, reveal to me what is the scripture saying? And that is very, very important. But if you're going to come to do Bible study and you have, this is what I know, this is what it is, then you're going to find yourself challenged and you can actually find yourself in a place that you don't want to find yourself because you'll find yourself rejecting truth because you want to hold on to tradition. So it's important to know that it is the truth that makes you free. Not what we think is truth, but only the actual truth can make us free. We, are, we have on the other side of the spectrum, there are some that hate him that rebukes in the gate and they abhor him that speaks uprightly. So sometimes when you bring truth to people, because it has been a, a long held tradition or because this is what I have known or because this is what my pastor has taught me and, and, and they, have, they give more reverence and they give more honor to what the pastor teaches them rather than the scripture itself. And they actually hate the truth. So we have to be really, really careful that we're not walking in a position where we despise truth. Hence, we are going to look at the rapture doctrine tonight, according to scripture. So to start with, I'm only going to read these four scriptures. We're not going to expound on it as yet. We're just going to see what the scriptures have to say, right? So let me just share my screen now. And we're just going to see what the scriptures have to see for some reason i have a lot of technical challenges tonight but it will be well in the name of yahushua hamashiach it will be well elohim is with us this is for his kingdom this is for his glory this is for his honor hallelujah hallelujah so the first one we're going to look at is the one of the famous verses that i used to talk about the rapture do we want the truth saints do you want to know the truth do you want to know actually is there a rapture is there a pre-trib rapture, a mid-trib rapture, a post-trib rapture, a rapture at all? What is the truth according to scripture? So now we're going to look at, hmm. Oh my goodness, I can't get my mouse to go. First Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 13. So First Thessalonians chapter 4. Let's go ahead. Verse 13 to 18. So like I said, we're just going to read the scriptures right now. And then we will dive right in. Hallelujah. So. But I would not have you ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. 
For if we died, for if we believe that Yahusha died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Yahusha will Elohim bring with him. For this cause, for this we say unto you by the word of Yahuwah, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of Yahuwah shall not prevent them which are asleep. For Yah himself shall descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of the archangel and with the shofar of Elohim and the dead in Mashiach shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet Yah in the air. And so shall we ever be with Yahuwah. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Let us also look at another verse which is frequently used to justify the rapture. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So we're just going to look at them quickly, 51 to 52 only. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the shofar shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. Let us look at 2 Thessalonians. We're going to dive right in afterwards. Chapter 2. Verse 1, now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Adonai, Yahusha HaMashiach, and by our gathering together unto him. So these are some scriptures that are frequently used to talk about the rapture, right? So what we're going to do now is first, let us start, let, this is a Bible study. So we're going to break things down. What we're going to do now, we're going to examine the meaning of rapture. What When we talk about rapture, what does that really mean? Oh my goodness, my mouse is just crazy. I can't get it to move. And I'm using three screens, so I really need my mouse. Meaning of rapture, the act of transporting a person from one sphere of existence to another, especially from earth to heaven. That's the Collins Online Dictionary. The esch eschatological position held by some Christians, particularly those of American evangelicalism, consisting of an end time event when all dead Christian believers will be resurrected and joined with Christians who are still alive together will rise in the clouds to meet Adonai in the air. So rapture is the act of transporting a person from one sphere of existence to another, especially from earth to heaven. I thought I heard someone at the door. So basically out there, we have three categories. We have the pre-tribulation -tri pre rapture, we have the tribulation rapture, and we have some who believe in the post-tribulation rapture. Now, these terms simply refer to when they believe the rapture will occur, right? So, I'm going to read an excerpt from you, for you, sorry. Ah, uh, one logical. I don't know if I can get that because I don't have the link now. Oh, yes, I managed to get it. Oh, please. Yeah. I had so much trouble today. With my laptops, praise yeah. I am able to pull it up quickly. So I'm going to share my screen. I'm sorry if I seem a bit out of my element right now, but I'm getting there. And I'm going to read an excerpt. This is someone who, who believes in the pre-tribulation rapture. We're not going to read everything, but there is a particular paragraph I'm looking for that I'm going to read for you, right? And this person has written a long, long article on why they believe the rapture is true. Now, what, what we are going to do tonight, and what happens a lot is that when people do Bible study, they take a verse in isolation. And that is why it's important to read your scriptures. You have to read from Genesis to Revelation. You cannot take things in isolation. All right, so let me let me start here. As a pre-tribulation rapture believer myself, I've had many discussions, or shall we call them de debates, with post-tribulationists, no matter what they try to throw at me to show the pre-trib as false. I have no problem explaining to them why the argument is wrong. Any scripture they, they can give me to support another stance, I can make it fit the pre-trib as well. And this is why when I started, I talked about when we come to do Bible study, when you want to know, because remember, Yahusha said in, 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 the, in, the, in the scriptures, and the doctrine that I have is not of my own. 
It is his father's doctrine. So there is a doctrine in the scriptures. It is important to establish that foundation. We must never, regardless of what it is, and I'm speaking to myself as well, never try to fit something, take the scriptures to fit what I believe. We are the ones who have to move and fit and ask yeah, Heavenly Father, help me to understand what the scripture is saying. No scripture is for private and personal interpretation. So right away, when you, right away when we see that this individual is saying, I can make it fit the pre-tube as well, is you see, they have the wrong approach to studying and finding out truth according to the word. word. We must never ever try to make it fit what we, what we believe. We want to know what the scripture is saying. Hallelujah. So the whole thing with this article is where he write to try to contradict them to show how he makes it all fit into his pre-tribulation doctrine. But what I want us to understand tonight is that what we read in Thessalonians is not in isolation of other parts of the scripture. So we are going to go on a journey now, right? And in this journey, we're going to see what scripture is going to reveal to us. So the key verse in particular, which we read when we started, used to prove rapture is this one. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet Yah in the air, and so shall we ever be with Yahuwah. So most people, even I myself, like I explained, when I came into the faith, because I was taught that, remember I always talk about we have inherited lies, we have inherited some truths, and we've inherited a lot of lies and deception. So I was taught this based on this verse. When it's, What does caught up mean? Caught up in the Greek is harpazo, and in Latin it is rapturo. Now, it's important to understand that the scriptures were written in Hebrew. I think I need to ask my son to bring my sefer as well because there is a scripture I have to read from the sefer and the BYNV. Um, so the scripture was written in Hebrew. And then the Greeks, you have the Septuagint, then you have the Latin Vulgate, and then you have from the Latin Vulgate, the King James Version. So the King James Version came off of the Textus Receptus, right? And the, Latin, and, and the Latin Vulgate for certain parts, because you had the King James, the very first part of the King James had both the Apocrypha and the King James Version. So you see, that is why the word rapture is in there. And when they translate it to English, we get the word rapture. But the word in Greek is hapazo. So we are caught up. But do we go to heaven for the seven-year tribulation period and return after? And this is basically what the pre-tribulation is believed, that they are caught up and they go to heaven during that time, before the tribulation happens, before the mark of the beast happens, that is what they believe. That is what I believe at one point in time, right? I wouldn't be here. We wouldn't be here for the mark of the beast. That's what I believed as well. My family, we believed that a very long, a long, long time ago. We wouldn't be here for the mark of the beast. We wouldn't be here for the tribulation. We'll be up there and we have people like John Hagee teaching this, right? You'll be up there on the balconies of heaven, his very own words, and the wicked will be down upon the earth. This is what the pre-tribulation is believed. But is that what will happen when we are caught up? Let us go on the journey. So the origin, this rapture doctrine, where did it come from? And I was doing some research and found that many attributed to John Nelson Darby, 1833 AD, and he popularized it in 1850. But it really originated with Manuel de la Cunza in 1812 AD. So before that time, it was not a doctrine that was, um, that was disseminated widely throughout the world. This was actually something that was brought up, invented, came about by Manuel de la Cunza. Now, the rapture doctrine is now called Darbyism. I'm sure if you have been in the charismatic movement, you would have heard that name before. I definitely have the evangelical movement. They talk about Darby a lot, right? So it's now called Darbyism by some. It was Manuel Lacunza, a Jesuit priest who wrote the coming of the Messiah in majesty and glory that came up with the idea. 
It was banned by the Pope and was smuggled to Ireland, where John Darby was a brother-in-law of the translator into English and publisher that gave him the idea. So here we have Lacunza who came up with it. It was banned by the Pope. And then we have Darby who took it and he now popularized the idea. So who was this Manuel de la Cunza? It's important to get some understanding of the foundation that he stood on. And we're not gonna dwell much on this part of the research, but it's important to understand where the doctrine came from because it was not a fundamental belief a priori before that. So Manuel de la Cunza was a Jesuit priest. He used the pseudonym Juan Yosafat ben Ezra in his main work. He was a, a converted Jew, according to him. A Catholic theologian now remembered for his influential study of eschatological prophecy, La Venida de Messias and Gloria, e Majestad, the coming of the Messiah in glory and majesty. I think I'll try to read from this screen. That one is too small for my eyes. Many regard his views as a precursor of some fundamentalist Adventist belief and is the foundation of Joseph Darby's work. Two who have been heavily influenced by Lacunza's work were Edward Irving, again, you would hear, you would have heard of that name in the charismatic movement, evangelical movement, and Joseph Darby. Now, some of his beliefs, Yahusha does not come to destroy the Antichrist, but just the brightness of his coming only will destroy him. So he believes just the, he stays, he doesn't really come, just the brightness will destroy the Antichrist. People who worship the Antichrist and took his mark will have an opportunity to be redeemed. We'll be seeing that. We'll be um, talking about that later. It is the bishops that will be taking part in the escape in the wilderness. For those of you who were here last week, you recall we talk about that escape in the wilderness, which is in the scriptures. But he believed, Lacunza, he believed that it is the bishops of the church. That sounds like all the rich and elite of this world that believe in the time of the apocalypse because they believe in an end time apocalypse. That's why they're building all the bunkers. Have you ever seen the million dollar bunkers? Have you ever seen the swimming pool and the cinema? Oh, and, and for gardening and the perfect life in the underground bunkers. It's so sad, isn't it? Really, really sad. A waste of money and a waste of time. So he believed it is the bishops that will be taking part in the escape during the reign of the Antichrist. I'm just asking my son to bring my BYNV. He also believed that the four beasts in the book of Daniel pertains only to four false religions, right? He also believes his views represent the views of the Catholic Church, the Church of England, and the Kirk of Scotland. So some of his errors, I'm going to show some direct quotes really quick because we're not dwelling on this. The purpose is to demonstrate where the belief came from because it was not a fundamental belief by the apostles. That's the start. So here are some direct quotes. The apostle says that Yahusha shall destroy the Antichrist with the brightness of his coming. But this does not mean to say that Adonai himself will come. This is somebody's interpretation. Bear that in mind. In his own person to destroy the Antichrist, which were unnecessary, but that without removing out of heaven, he will destroy him even with the spirit. Thank you. Even with the spirit of his mouth, that is by his command, even with the brightness of his coming, that is by the morning or dawning of the great day of his coming he also believes this we're going to go through what he believes really fast and these are justifications so you're seeing it's not my own words there must be time they say first for very many christians who have renounced christ and adored the antichrist to acknowledge their faith to do works meet for repentance and to be once more admitted into the bosom of the church so in other words he's saying those who have adored and worshiped the antichrist will be able to do works meet for repentance afterwards and be admitted into the bosom of the church there must be time in the second place for the bishops of all the earth who in the time of the great tribulation had fled into the wilderness the bishops of the earth fled into the wilderness welcome brother steel for the head missed you up a couple of weeks wonderful to have you here i hope your family they're doing well welcome thank you so much for joining joining us welcome yahusha rain welcome welcome glad you can be here i hope that you're doing well so he believes this Manuel de la Cunza, who has started the movement of the rapture belief, believe that it is the bishops of all the earth that will be 
in the time of the great tribulation would have fled into the wilderness which they would have had to be signified by the light the flight of that remarkable woman clothed with the sun and we covered that last week if any of you missed it we talked about what revelation 12 means with the woman the sun and the entire chapter so we're not going to go into that into much detail this week. Into the wilderness, the wilderness set forth in the 12th chapter of the Apocalypse, as we shall see in its proper place to receive sure intelligence of Antichrist's death and the entire ruin of his empire. empire. There shall be time in the third place for these same bishops to return to their churches and to gather again the relics of their former flock to attend to their wounds, to exhort them, to teach them anew, and furnish them with all the food necessary and suitable to such circumstance. Did you ever read any of this in the scriptures? I know your answer. One more. Now let this book be read as a voice from the Roman Catholic Church, because remember he was a Catholic priest, even if he got banned after. And let the Palingenesia, and he was also a Jesuit. That too is important to know. And Basilica's letters of my friend to be read as a voice from the Church of England. And let the substance of my discourses for the last year as given above be read as a voice from the Kirk of Scotland. So we have established that John Nelson Darby, who has promulgated and spread the rapture doctrine, he got his original, he got his original work. He built upon, I should say, the original work of this Jesuit priest. Manuel de la Cunza. So according to Darby, the current church age was a parenthesis in Yah's plan for Israel and the end times would be marked by a serious catastrophic event and the rise of a global movement under the Antichrist. Before the tribulation period, Christ would return secretly. I highlighted this verse with this word because we're going to look at that according to scripture tonight. Secretly to rapture the church gathering believers up to meet him in the air and eventually returning to earth to bring final judgment and establish Christ's millennium kingdom on earth. Darby's teachings were controversial and not widely accepted during his lifetime, but they became more influential in the late 19th and early 20th centuries and have had a lasting impact on Christian theology and eschatology to this day. A lasting impact because the sure thing is that to this day, many, many churches around the world believe in the rapture doctrine don't even know how it started where it came from and what did the apostles actually believe and what's in scripture and many of them like me when i came into the faith i was taught it and didn't read my scripture wasn't reading my scripture and then when i do begin to read my scripture it is important as i've said and i know i keep emphasizing this because i i hope that you are grasping this Anytime you have a question that you're asking Yahuwah for guidance on according to his word, you submit to him. You have to forget your programming. You have to forget your tradition and what you've learned and ask him to reveal to you what the scripture is saying. Because we saw here from onegodlogic.com that he said that if anybody came to him with any verse contrary to the pre-trib rapture, he would be able to show them as well how it fits his pre-trib version. That's not somebody who wants the truth. That's just somebody who wants to believe what he wants to believe. But we have to hunger and thirst after righteousness. What is righteousness? Right standing with Elohim through Yahusha HaMashiach, right? And Yahusha is the way, the truth and the life. And we don't want to be deceived. Hallelujah. So what we're going to do now, we're not going to cover this. We might probably cover this in a separate live as another topic. But before Yahusha actually come, some of the events that will be taking place, plagues from Yahuwah, the sealing of the 144,000, the first war and the fifth trumpet, the second war, the power of prophecy of his two, to his two witnesses for 1,260 days, the three ages. And we talked about that in depth last, last week regarding Revelation chapter 12. When you go through Revelation chapter 12, I showed you how Elohim put on my heart that it represented the three ages. You have the age of Yasharel with the woman and the 12 stars on her head. Then you have the age of the Messiah, his birth, death, resurrection, and ascension. And then you have the age at, of the end of the age, right? The end of the world, the latter times. And you will be able to see that when you go through the chapter. You have the escape in the wilderness. You have the total casting out of the dragon, the last fury of the dragon, because the Antichrist and his reign is actually the last fury of the dragon. You have the reign of the Antichrist. You have wrath on anyone who took the mark of the beast. You have the final last plagues, 
the golden bowls full of water and indignation of Elohim, and the sentencing of the great harlot and the coming of Yahusha. Hallelujah. So what we're going to do now is we're going to dive into the saints caught up to meet our Adonai. And so we have uh, several events that have to take place before Yahusha actually comes. And I just thought just to highlight them, but we won't cover that in today's, um, today's message. Rather, we're focusing on the rapture. So the saints caught up to meet Adonai. Now we're going to go deep into a lot of scriptures. We've covered the research part of this, where we've seen by research that this actually started with Manuel de la Cunza and John Darby. Now, let us go into the scriptures and see what is the scripture saying, saying to us. While we were doing our live on examining the rapture doctrine, I had two conflicting things on different slides. And even I myself was, I was like, what, what, what do I have here? And I said that I would get some clarity and I would come back. And that troubled me so much that I didn't have a good night's sleep. As soon as I woke up in the morning, it was the first thing on my mind. So I just deleted the live. I downloaded it first, but I deleted the live because I take I take this very seriously when Yahuwah has given me, you know, allow me to come and present such Bible studies to you. I take it really seriously. I'm not saying that I cannot make mistake, mistakes and error. And that is why I did say straight out, I was honest and say, well, something is, um, I have some conflicting stuff here. Let me get some clarity and come back. And to be quite honest, yesterday before my life was a really, really rough day, like I mentioned. And my, my daughter had an appointment and I mentioned that four times in all. So I during the day at two o'clock, I emailed myself the presentation, thought it came. And when I came 15 minutes before to set myself up and go through my presentation, I realized it, it wasn't sent. And then three times before my life, I'm emailing it to myself because I did it on a different laptop. And then when I actually check my email, it's showing sent, but it's not in my inbox. And finally, it was like 10.32. And that's when it came through in my inbox. And I need to be live at 10.30. And I have never come on live without first going back over my presentation. So had I gone over my presentation, I would have pick, picked up that conflicting, those two conflicting sides. Now I'm going to show you why it was conflicting. So we're going to continue with who will actually be taken first when, it, when we are caught up. That's what we're going to continue right now. Who will actually be taken first? And I'm going to tell you why I had two conflicting um, information on my slides. The, in fact, the information was accurate, but how I labeled my slide was wrong. And let me show this to you. It is because of this. So we went through here, the saints caught up to meet our Adonai. This is a scripture that many use to justify the rapture. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Yahusha died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Yahusha will Elohim bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of Yahuwah, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of Yahuwah shall not prevent them which are asleep. For Yah himself shall descend. And that's a word that is frequently overlooked by those who, de who believe in the rapture document, the rapture, doc rapture doctrine. For Yah himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the shofar of Elohim, and the dead in Mashiach shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with him shall be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet Yah in the air. And so shall we ever be with Yahuwah. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. So we see here, he himself shall descend, right? And we see with the voice of an archangel, with the shofar of Elohim and the dead in Mashiach shall rise first. Then we shall, then we, we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. Is that a secret rapture? Is this a secret? This is something that all will see. Hallelujah. Wherefore, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet Yah in the air. It is a meeting in the air. So that is the scripture that is used by those who believe in the rapture. Now, the scripture by, that is used by some to say that the wicked is taken first. That's what we're going to look at now. We're going to look at Mark 13, right? So let's pull up Mark 13. Right. So this is a scripture that is used by many to say that it is the wicked that is taken first. 
this is what my slide should have said last week because what happened is when I was going through this, remember I said at the beginning that I was doing my Bible study and I read lots of different scriptures, but I just didn't know how to put together the presentation, what to share, how to go about what. And it was up to this point that had I had stopped because even this is what I used to believe before my Bible study for this session, that it was the wicked taken first because of this parable, which I've always heard also. But when I went and prayed the morning of the live on the floor and surrendered to Yahuwah, and I was explaining that intention is really important because my intention before that was trying to put it together in one hour. And then Yah showed me that, hey, you just allow the Holy Spirit, allow the Ruach HaKadosh to work in you. And then even if you have to cover it in sections, you cover it in sections. And it was when I submitted to him yesterday morning in the life, uh, yesterday morning before the life, when I submitted to him, then the whole flow came. And then I went back to study some other scriptures. And then I realized it is not the wicked that is taken first when Yahushua is coming. This is what I believe prior to this Bible study. And that is why I always say when you come to do Bible study, you have to humble Forget what you believe, come like a clean slate and ask Elohim and let the scripture reveal itself to you. And scripture always confirms scripture as we are going to see. Now, what we all is or what we have seen, people who debunk the rapture use this scripture to say, Well, hey, it is the wicked taken full. So let's go through it. Another parable is set forth before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while he was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed also Daniel, weeds resembling wheat among the wheat, and went on his way. So when the plants sprouted and formed grain, the Daniel weeds appeared also. And the servants of the owner came to him and said, Sir, do you not sow good seed in your field? Then how does it have Daniel shoots in it? He replied to them, An enemy has done this. The servant said to him, Then do you want us to go, out, go and weed them out? But he said, No, lest in gathering wild wheat, Weeds, remember weeds, weeds resembling wheat, you root up the true wheat along with it because the tares and the wheat look alike. Let them go together until the harvest. In reality, the tares and the wheat look alike. And at harvest time, I will say to the reapers, gather the darnel first and bind it in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat in my granary. Another story by way of comparison. Sorry, let them go together until the harvest. And at harvest time, I will say to the reapers, Gather the garnel first and bind it in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my granary. So this is a scripture that is used by many, which I myself believe prior to this very Bible study, that it was the wicked that was gathered first. And it was yesterday morning after my prayer. I'm doing this recording after the live because, like I mentioned, of the little com the, the too conflicting information, but this is why it was conflicting. After my prayer yesterday morning, then Yah revealed to me this parable is not about the time when, the, when Yahusha returns. Because when we look at the following scriptures we're going to look at now, it says, when, the, when the, son of, the coming of the Son of Man is like unto the days of Noah. The coming of the Son of Man is like unto the days of Lot. That is different. This parable actually is about the consummation of time. The kingdom of heaven and at the consummation of time, when that day of judgment comes, Actually, the wicked first will be gathered and stand before you have to get the judgment. And this is what this is saying here, right? So he's given a parable of the kingdom of heaven. They will be gathered first and bundles to be burnt, right, on that great and terrible day. So when we meet here in the air, so that is the focus of this parable. There is a difference between the parable of the kingdom of heaven and the coming of the son of man, right? So this, this, this parable pertains to the end of time. Now, what we're going to look at now is who will be taken first. So we're going to go to Matthew 24. And now we're going to see who will be taken first. Matthew 24. And Matthew 10, 24 talks about all the different things. And we don't have to read the whole chapter now. I invite you to read the whole chapter. But Yahusha lists out the different things that shall happen before he comes. The wars, the rumors of wars, nation against nation, right? And affliction and tribulation and the false prophet that shall arise and the multiplied lawlessness and iniquity. And that he who endures to the end will be saved. 
He talks about the good news of the kingdom being preached throughout all the world as a testimony to the nations. And then will the end come? Now, when we continue, we were going down to where he talks about, let me start from, then let all those, so when you see, we read from 15. So when you see the appalling sacrilege, the abomination that astonishes and make desolate, spoken of by the prophet Daniel, standing in the holy place, let the reader take notice and ponder and consider and heed this. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the house stop not come down and go into the house to take anything. And we know that abomination of desolation. We know we had a miniature of that in the time of the Maccabees, but that also is going to happen again with the Antichrist. And he talks about that time when those who are in the house stop not come down and go into the house to take anything. Those who are in the field not turn back to get his overcoat. And for the women who are pregnant, who have nursing babies in those days, pray that your flight be not in winter or Shabbat. For those that say that the Sabbath is abolished. For then, at that time, there will be great tribulation, which we will do soon discover, we will be talking about later. For then will be great tribulation, such as has not been from the beginning of the world until now, no, and never will be. And if, this day, and if those days had not been shortened, no human would endure and survive, but for the sake of the elect, Elohim's chosen ones, those days would be shortened. Now, I used to think when he says those days would be shortened, it actually meant that the day instead of 24 hours, it would be 22 or 23 or however he shortens it. But Yah has revealed to me through doing this Bible study, when he says the days would be shortened, he's actually talking about the time frame, which we're going to look at later. The time frame of the great tribulation is a short period of time. So when he says the days will be shortened, he's speaking to the time that the Antichrist, the time that of that great tribulation is allowed. And remember, the saints will be overpowered. That time will be is, is a shortened time for the elect's sake. See, I have warned you beforehand. So if they say to you, he's in the wilderness, do not go there. If they tell you, behold, he's in the secret place or in the rooms, do not believe it. For just as the lightning flashes from the east and shines, and is seen as far as the west, so will he come, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. Wherefore, there is a fallen body, a corpse, there the vultures or eagles will flock together. And we're going to see later on why the coming of the Son of Man, there is a discussion here, there is a highlight here about those fallen bodies and those corpses, and where the birds will be gathered and flock together, we'll be covering that later. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be, will be darkened, now we're talking about the coming of Yahushua. The moon will not shed its light and the stars will fall from the sky and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn and beat their breasts and lament in anguish and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory in brilliancy and splendor. And he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call and will gather his elects from the four winds, from the one end of the universe to the other. So who is taken first for that meeting in the air? At the time of the meeting in the air, his elect is taken first at the time of the meeting in the air. His elect, and not the wicked as you see all over the internet, which I to believe prior to this very Bible study, it is his elect that is taken first. And I'm going to show it to you. I'm going to prove it to you with scripture. Remember, scripture confirms scripture. And you know you have the right interpretation. What has been revealed to you is correct. So let's go through this. From the fig tree, learn this lesson. As soon as its young shoot comes, becomes soft and tender and it puts out its leaves, you know of a surety that summer is near. So also when you see these signs all taken together, coming to pass, know of a surety that is near at the very doors. Truly, I tell you, this generation, the whole multitude of people living at the same time in a definite given period will not pass away till all these things taken together take place. And that is why there are some who believe, and I, I talked about this in a previous live, that um, we were in a thousand year reign now and the enemy is bound now because Yahushua say, I tell you that this generation, meaning the people of that time. When he says this generation, is the generation of man on the earth. This generation, we people, this generation will not pass away till all these things have to have taken place together. That's what he's talking about here. So sky and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But of that exact day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the son, but only the father. As were the days of Noah, 
so will the coming of the Son of Man be. Just For just as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, men marrying and women being given in marriage until the very day when Noah went into the ark. And they did not know or understand until the flood came and swept them all away. So will be the coming of the Son of Man. So who was taken first? Noah first went into the ark. And then the judgment, then the wrath of Elohim was poured out. He first was taken into the ark. At that time, two men would be in the field. One would be taken and one would be left. Two women will be grinding at the handmill. One will be taken and one will be left. And this is where some believe, um, okay, let me go through it first. Watch therefore, give strict attention, be cautious and active for you do not know in what kind of a day, whether a near or re remote, your Adonai is coming. But understand this, had the householder known in one part of the night, whether in a night or a morning, watch the thief was coming, he would have watched and would not have allowed his house to be undermined and broken into. You also must be ready, therefore, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour when you do not expect him. Who then is the faithful, thoughtful, and wise servant whom his master has put in charge of the household to give to the others the food and supplies at the proper time? So the shepherds, the servants, they are supposed to be feeding the flock. Hallelujah. Blessed, happy, fortunate, and to be envied is that serpent whom when his master comes, he will find him so doing. Feeding the flock, watching, and waiting. I solemnly declare to you, he will set him over all his possessions. But if that servant is wicked and says to himself, my master is delayed in his coming and is going to be gone a long time and begins to eat his and begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with the drunken, the master of that servant will come a day when he does not expect him and at an hour of which he is not aware and will punish him, cut him up by scourging and put him with the pretenders, the hypocrites. There will be weeping and grinding of teeth. So we see here that just as in the days of Noah, Noah went into the ark first. And we can read about Noah in Genesis chapter 6, verse 5 and 8. When you go to Genesis chapter 6, verse 5 and 8, it tells you when Elohim instructed Noah to build the ark. Hallelujah. Yahuwah looked and he saw the wickedness of man was great on the earth, that every imagination in, and intention of all human thinking was only evil continually. And Yahuwah regretted he had made man. So we know that man was evil in the days of Noah. We know what was happening also with the giants that were born. So he repented, he made man, and it grieved his heart. And Yahuwah said, I will destroy him who have, I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast. Oh, sorry, I'm not sharing my screen. Both man and beast and the creeping thing and the falls of the air, for I repent that I have made man. But Noah found grace in the eyes of Yahuwah. So Noah and his family found grace in the eyes of Yahuwah. When we go into Genesis chapter 7, we read about Elohim sending the animals to Noah. And Noah went into the ark, right? And I'm just bringing this here as proof. Scripture confirms scripture. The coming of the son of man is as like the days of Noah. So what happened in the days of Noah? Hallelujah. What happened in the days of Noah? In the days of Noah, when Elohim sent all the animals into the ark, right? We would not need to read the whole chapter now, but we're going to see here. And they went into the ark, verse 15. Two and two of all flesh, wherein is the breath of life. And they that went in, went in male and female, all flesh as Elohim had commanded him. And Yahuwah shut him in. He shut in him. And the flood was 40 days upon the earth. And the waters increased and bore up the ark. And it was lifted up above the earth. So in the days of Noah, he went into the ark first. And then the wrath of Elohim was poured out. The coming of the Son of Man is as the days of Noah. Let's look at another incident, scripture confirming scripture. What is the coming of the Son of Man is, again, according to scripture. The coming of the Son of Man, according to scripture. Luke chapter 17, verse 22, right? And he said to his disciples, this time is coming when you will long to see even one of the days of the Son of Man and you will not see it. And they will say to you, look, he is there, or look, he is here, but do not go out to follow them. 
For like the lightning that flashes and lights up the sky from one end to the other, so will the Son of Man be in his own day. So the coming of the Son of Man, we're going to read about again. But first he must suffer many things and be disapproved and repudiated and rejected by this age and generation. And just as it was in the days of Noah, we just read that, so will it be in the time of the Son of Man. They ate, they drank, they don't care. So when Yahusha is returning, people will be living their life. They don't care in fornication, abomination, corruption, you know, lawlessness, right? Living their life. Elohim's people will be raising the shout, raising the alarm, warning, and he that have an ear to hear will hear. They ate, they drink in marriage. They ate, they drank, they married, they were given in marriage right up to the day when Noah went into the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. So also, who went into the ark first? Noah. So also, it was the same as it was in the days of Lot. So let's look at the days of Lot. The people ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. But on the very day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Who left first in the days of Lot? The angels made, for, made sure first that Lot and his family, right, escaped. They sent them out of the city at a particular distance as well first. And then rained the wrath of Elohim upon the people. So just as it was in the days of Lot, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. But on that very day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. That is the way it will be on the day that the son of the man of man will be revealed. On that day, let him who is on the house top with his belongings in the house not come down and go inside to carry them away. And likewise, let him who is in the field not turn back. Remember Lot's wife. Whoever tries to preserve his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life will preserve it and quicken it. I tell you, in that night, there will be two men in one bed. One will be taken and the other will be left. There will be two men grinding together. One will be taken and the other left. Two men will be in the field. One will be taken and the other left. Then they asked him, where Elohim? He said to them, wherever the dead body is there, will the vultures or eagles be gathered together? So as it was in the days of Lot and Noah, we will be meeting Yahusha in the sky, in the air. We'll be meeting Yahusha in the air. But as for the wicked, there will be two together. One will be taken, the other left. Because everybody on the earth will not be punished. Not everyone on the earth will be punished. So there'll be two together. And one will be taken to be killed and the other left. And we'll be seeing later, well, later where the judgment that is taking place. Because a lot of people confuse the coming of Yahusha with the day of judgment. And that's why they get it mixed up and fail to get the understanding. The coming of Yahusha, his return is a separate event from the final day of judgment, which is after the second resurrection. But when he comes, there is a judgment that he executes that we are going to cover later. Now, let us just quickly look at the days of Lot. I mean, we know it very well, so I won't read it, but just to prove the scripture. So you see that I'm not talking to, I'm not running my own mouth, saying my own thing. In the days of Lot, we're going to, only going to look at the escape. Genesis 18, right? 20 to 33, but we would only look at. So in, the, in Genesis 18, we have um, Yahuwah talking to Abraham, telling him he's going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abraham is pleading with Yahuwah. And let's just only look at the last few verses here. And he said unto him, verse 30, Oh, let not Adonai be angry and I will speak. Perchance there shall be 30 be found there. And he said, I will not do it if I find 30. And he said, Behold, now I've taken upon me to speak unto Yahuwah. Perchance there shall be 20 found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for 20 sake. And he said, Oh, not let a Yahuwah be angry and I will speak yet. But this once, perchance 10 shall be found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for the sake of 10. And Yahuwah went his way as soon as he had left communion with El Abraham and Abraham returned unto his place. It was a remnant. A remnant will be saved at the time of Yahusha's return. Alive on the earth will be a remnant. Alive on the earth. Just as in Sodom and Gomorrah, where Yahuwah could not even find 10 there. We see in Genesis 19 when the angels were dispatched according to the word of Yahuwah. And they were finally dispatched to execute the judgment of Yahuwah. Now we're not going to read the whole thing, but we're going to look at just a few verses. Just to, for scripture 
to confirm scripture. 15, and when the morning arose, then the angels hastened not, saying, Arise, take your woman and your two daughters, which are here, lest you be consumed in the iniquity of the city. And while he lingered, the men laid hold upon his hand and upon the hand of his woman and upon the hand of his two daughters, Yahuwah being merciful unto them, and they brought him forth and sent him without the city. And it came to pass when they had brought them forth abroad that he said, Escape for your life, look not behind you, neither stay in all the circle of Yadan, escape to the mountain lest you be consumed. They escaped first. And Lot said unto them, Oh, not so, my Adonai. Behold, now your servant has found grace in your sight, and you have magnified your mercy, which you have showed me in saving my life. I cannot escape to the mountain, lest some evil take me, and I die. So now Lot is asking for him to send him to a city, some other city, right, which is not, which is near to flee unto. And the angel said, well, I have accepted you concerning this thing which you have spoken. Then he said in 22, make haste, escape thither, for I cannot do anything till you are come thither. Therefore, the name of the city was called Saul. The sun was risen upon the earth when Lot entered into Saul. Then Yahuwah rained upon Sidom and upon Amoha, brimstone and fire from Yahuwah out of the heavens. And he overthrew those cities and all the circle of the Yadan and all the inhabitants of the cities that which grew upon the ground. But his woman looked back from behind and she became a pillar of salt. And Abraham got up early in the morning to place where he stood before. And he looked towards Sidom and Amor and towards all the land of the circle of the Yadan. And behold, lo, the smoke of the country went up as the smoke of a furnace. So we see here that Lot first escaped. And then Yahuwah reigned his wrath and indignation. So the coming of the Son of Man will be as in the days of Noah. The coming of the Son of Man will be as in the days of Lot. Who will be taken first? He will guard his, his elect will be guarded first. We will meet him in the air. Just as in the days of Noah, his family went into the ark first. And in the days of Lot and his family went out of the city first. And then judgment came on the unrighteous. Then the wrath of Elohim came on the unrighteous. That is what is going to happen again. Right? So many people believe it's the wicked because of the parable of the wheat and the tares. But the parable of the wheat and the tares was a parable Yahushua was given about the kingdom of heaven, which was different to the coming of the son of man. Do you understand that? So I hope this has blessed you. And um, that troubled my heart because I had that mix up on my slide. And I don't know, for some reason, I froze. I haven't never experienced this before. And the thoughts, I got rattled in my thoughts. And being, I already had all the pressures I had, not being able to go over my slides and my four emails sending my presentation, it's not arriving and I have to go live. And, you know, all this got me flustered. So I couldn't sleep and I could not, I'd had no peace in my spirit because I take this very, very seriously. I take it very seriously. So I hope it has blessed you. And then, of course, we will carry on with what was the expectation of the Jews? Did Yasharel and the prophets and disciples expect to be raptured? What were the expectations? And you will not understand prophecy if you do not read your entire scriptures. That is why it's very important to read the entire scriptures. There are some who say, well, you know what? Um, all was fulfilled when Yahusha came, so I don't read the Old Testament. That is wrong. That is wrong. Even in the, when you read the New Testament, it talks about the scriptures. What were the scriptures at the time? What we call the Old Testament. So that is very wrong. And there are things that have not yet been fulfilled. So... Were they awaiting rapture? What was the expectation? You will understand. And if you see, you have, if you have the replacement theology, you are going to struggle where you, you think that the church has replaced Israel. And we're going to cover that later so you can see the understanding of what it really is. But if you have that replacement theology as John Hagee and many of those out there are teaching, you're not going to get it. When you're doing Bible study, humble yourself. Come before Yahuwah for guidance and say, Father, reveal, in, reveal unto me your scripture, what it is saying. And that sometimes means to forget what you've learned, right? Just as I, I, I experienced on my slide that I had done my study a priori, right, before Thursday morning, I had that the wicked would be raptured first because of what I believed. And that Thursday morning when I went flat on my face and prayed and asked for Elohim help, and he said unto me, my intent was wrong because I wanted to think of how I could do it, you know, do, put it all in one hour, you know. And then I had to submit to him and just let him, let the Ruach HaKadosh guide me. Then 
he he revealed it into my spirit. Yahusha says the coming of the son of man is as in the days of Noah and in the days of Lot. And he said unto me, it is different from the parable of the kingdom of heaven. And I'm like, yes, yes. And I didn't make that change in my slide. That was, that's why there was a little complication there. The change was not made in my slide. And my daughter had her stuff to do yesterday. I'm not making excuses. I, this will not happen again. Do my very best. And I didn't get to go over my slides before. It really troubled my spirit. But now I feel better. Hallelujah. I give Elohim all the praise that I come. And I did. I was honest and let you know, well, hey, there's something conflicting here. Let me get the clarity and come back. And this is what it is. The coming of Yahusha is as in the days of Noah. It, has, is, it is as in the days of the son of, as in the days of Lot. As in the days of Noah, they went into the ark first. The wrath indignation came. As in the days of Lot, they escaped the city first. The wrath, the, in, the indignation of Yahuwah came. As in the days of Yahusha, we meet him. We caught up to meet him in the air. Where do we go when we meet him in the air? We're going to cover that. So you, you will see that later on in this presentation. But um, we meet, caught up to meet him in the air. And then there is judgment. But this judgment that he brings, when he goes to Jerusalem, which we're going to see later in the presentation, right, is different from the final day of judgment after the second resurrection. Now, the disciples knew this. And the disciples were waiting on the consolation, the redemption of Israel. And this is the prophecy for Israel to no longer be two kingdoms, but one. And David is his servant shall be king over him. And now we're going to discover this according to the scripture. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise Elohim. You know, and let me just say this quickly. When I was doing my research, I came upon, I wonder if I can find it here in Jasher. I think I will just cover this really quickly as it's in my spirit. The book of Jasher, it talks about even when Noah was brought into the ark. Because in doing this research, I found someone who said that, oh, um, the people had no idea. And um, if I am building an ark outside my home, wouldn't people know? Of course, people in other parts of the world would not know, but certain people knew. And of course, Abraham would not have kept his mouth shut because remember, Abraham is referred to in the scriptures also as a prophet. So he would have warned, but the people didn't care. And that's how it will be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. And we saints crying out now, warning people. They fall on this video sometimes by mistake. Well, I shouldn't say mistake, but they fall on this video. Right, because Elohim led them to this video and many other videos, telling them to repent and accept Yahusha HaMashiach. And do they listen? No. And likewise, in the days of Noah, he warned them. And we see that in the book of Jasher. In the book of Jasher, I won't go through the entire chapter. It talked about the same ark account. Now, as in Genesis, but it's just that it goes, it gives you even a little more depth. And it talks about, I'm just going down to the part where he warned them. Right, and all the animals, so two by two came to Noah in the ark, but from clean animals and clean fowls, he brought seven couples as Elohim had commanded him. And all the animals and beasts and fowls were still there, and they surrounded the ark at every place, and the rain had not descended till seven days after. And on that day, Yahuwah caused the whole earth to shake, and the sun darkened, and the foundations of the world raged, and the whole earth was moved violently, so there was a terrible earthquake. And the lightning flashed and the thunder roared and all the fountains in the earth were broken up such as was not known to the inhabitants before. And Elohim did this mighty act in order to terrify the sons of men that there might be no more evil upon the earth. So Elohim did this mighty act and still they didn't repent. As we're going to see in the book of Revelation, when Elohim brings the wrath and pours out the plagues, it says still they blasphemed the Elohim of the heaven. They didn't repent because of the hardness of their heart and the evil in these people. And still the sons of men would not return from their evil ways. And they increased the anger of Yahuwah at that time and did not even direct their hearts to all this. And at the end of seven days in the 600th year of the life of Noah, the waters of the flood were upon the earth and all the fountains of the deep were broken up and the windows of heaven were opened and the rain was upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights. Um, and Noah and his household and li the living creatures that were with him came into the ark on account of the waters of the flood and Yahuwah shut him in. He went in first, he was shut in. And all the sons of men that were left upon the earth became exhausted through evil on account of the rain. 
for the waters were coming more violently upon the earth and the animals and the beasts were still surrounding the ark. So that's those that didn't go in, remember. And the sons of men assembled together about 700,000 men and women. And they came unto Noah to the ark and they called unto Noah saying, open for us that we may come to the ark and wherefore shall we die? And Noah with a loud voice answered them from the ark saying, have you not all rebelled against Yahuwah and said that he does not exist? And therefore Yahuwah has brought you this evil to destroy and cut you off from the face of the earth. Is not this the thing that I spoke to you of 120 years back because he didn't build the ark in seven days and you would not hearken to the voice of Yahuwah and now do you desire to live upon the earth? So he was warning while building the ark. Warning. Any man of Elohim would do that. So it is, it is not right, as I read on the internet, to think that Noah didn't say anything to anyone. That is not right. And is not this the thing, right? And they said to Noah, we are ready to return to Yahuwah, only open for us that we may live and not die. And Noah answered them saying, behold, now that you see the trouble of your souls, you wish to return to Yahuwah. Why did you not return during these 120 years when Yahuwah granted you as the granted you as the determined period? But now you come and tell me this on account of the troubles of your souls. Now also Yahuwah will not listen to you. Neither will he give air to you on this day so that you will not now succeed in your wishes. So just as in the days of Noah, Noah warned them while he was building this ark. 120 years warning them they had a, a predetermined period to repent we know that noah was chosen we know he and his family was chosen but this just goes to show us the evil of man's heart we are going to see when yahuwah brings the plagues you see in the book of revelation that the plagues come upon the earth the boils come upon those who take the mark of the beast and we see all the evil that they speak with their mouth when receiving the judgment and the wrath of Elohim, they still will not repent. So when Yahusha will be returning, man's heart will be evil. It will be a lawless society, a lawless world. A remnant will be alive, remain a remnant alive. But we who are his saints will first be caught up to meet him in the air. And then, and then, and then there will be those of the evil people remaining who will be selected to be to 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 selected to be killed which we are also going to be covering later on in this presentation this is not me saying it this is what is in scripture because yahusha is not returning to earth to govern earth with only saints on it there will be people still on it on this earth right there will be people he comes to establish his government and be king of kings here upon the earth walk in his office and fulfill he is king of kings but now fulfill and establish his government and his role as king of kings upon the earth hallelujah so be blessed be blessed you know the truth now the rapture there's no secret rapture that is a lie we see in the videos i was watching a, a, a movie and they're showing in the movie that secret rapture and people close rema re remaining. I was watching it just because I was doing this live. Curious to see what they were showing. The Left Behind series. These are all the deception of the enemy to, you know, reinforce. You, you see, when you want to teach, when you want to, in brainwashing, in brainwashing, you have to reinforce the mind control that you're teaching. So the enemy teaches that has brought in this lie, who it was Manuel de la Cunza, the Jesuit priest, which Darby has taken. And every shepherd just pass on and pass on and pass on. And they learn it in the, the cemetery, in the, what you call it, where they go and learn, I forget the name, seminary. <laughs> and they just come and teach it, but they never study for truth. Do we want truth or do we just want to hold on to tradition and what we believe? Do we want truth? Hallelujah. We want truth. So we study the scripture and we get truth according to the scripture. And if we love the truth, as we are asked to love the truth by the scripture, it's easy now to put away with the tradition. So the rapture is a deceptive doctrine. It's a deception. There's no secret rapture. But when we caught up to meet him, where do we go? We're going to cover that after we talk about what was the expectation now of the apostles and the, and the people who were looking for the Messiah at that time. What was their expectation? That's what we're going to cover. But what I want us to discover now with the rapture doctrine that came in, what was the expectation of the Jews at the time? What was their expectation? Were they expecting Yahusha to come and to actually take them out of 
of this earth and rapture them up into heaven? What were the expectation? And we see, we're going to see in the scriptures that the prophets, the disciples, they did not expect to be raptured. What the expectation was is that the Messiah would come and there will be a restoration of the kingdom. So we have where the enemy has brought in this deception into the church. And the deception into the church is where, hey, um, we're going to be taken out of here. We're not going to be around when any of this happens. And it will be only the wicked who will be dwelling upon the earth. But this is not the case. This is not what the disciples, this is not what the prophets, this is not what they talked about. And for us to understand prophecy, it's really important that we read our entire scriptures. If you believe, believe in replacement theology, replacement theology talks about, for instance, that because of Yahusha, because Yahusha has come, and it's now about the church, why we saw Manuel de la Conza said it's the bishops that will be in the wilderness, and not anybody else, but the bishops all over the earth, they are the ones that get to escape, and they believe the church has be replaced Israel. If you believe in replacement theology, where the church has replaced Israel, then you're going to have a hard time accepting what the scripture actually says is going to happen when Yahusha returns. You will have a very, very hard time. So what we're going to look at is what the scripture says in terms of the expectation. We're going to look at the book of Luke chapter 2. What was the expectation when the Messiah came? It tells us, based on these scriptures we are going to read, what the expectation was. Luke chapter 2, verse 35 to 40. And a sword shall pierce through your own soul also, that the secret thoughts and purposes of many hearts may be brought and out and disclosed. And there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel, the tribe of Asher, she was very old, having lived with her husband seven years from her maidenhood. And as a widow, even for 84 years, she did not go out from the temple enclosure, but was worshipping night and day with fasting and prayer. And she too came up at the same hour and she returned thanks to Elohim and talked to Yahusha, to all who were looking for the redemption, deliverance of Jerusalem. So they were looking for the, the, the redemption and deliverance of Jerusalem. Let us see what the prophets looked for. So here we have Anna, a prophetess. We have Ezekiel. Because now when we understand what the prophets looked, looked for, awaited, what the disciples awaited, then we will also know what we are to expect when Yahusha returns. Is he going to take us out of here into heaven? So Ezekiel 37 verse 15 to 28. The word of Yahuwah came again to me saying, son of man, take a stick and write on it for Judah and the children of Israel, his companions. Then take another stick and write upon it for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim and all the house of Israel, his companions, and join them together into one stick that they may become one in your hand. This is the restoration of Israel. We know that Judah and Israel were divided. I actually heard in preparing for this, this um, message i was listening to a clip by joseph prince and joseph prince i don't watch him but i was trying to find when i was putting the clips together that we started with and he said that we know that israel was restored in 1948 and that is totally totally wrong that is actually a deception of the enemy because according to scripture when israel is, is restored it will no longer be a divided kingdom it will be one but what does that oneness mean that one mess means with Judah and Israel coming together, we're going to get to that later on, what that oneness actually means. And join them together into one stick that they may become one in your hand. And when your people say to you, will you not show us what you mean by these? Say to them, thus says Yahuwah Sevaud, behold, I will take the stick of Joseph, Joseph, which is in the hand of Ephraim and the tribes of Israel, his associate, and I will join it with the stick of Judah and make them one stick and they shall be in my hand when the sticks on which you write shall be in your hand before their eyes, then say to them, thus says Yahuwah Sevaud, behold, I will take the children of Israel from among the nations to which they have gone and will gather them from every side and bring them into their own land. And I will make them one nation in the land upon the mountains of Israel and one king shall be over them all. And they shall be no longer two nations, neither be divided into two kingdoms anymore. They shall not defile themselves anymore with idols 
and their detestable things or with any of their transgressions, but I will save them out of their dwelling places and from all their backslidings in which they have sinned. And I will cleanse them so they shall be my people and I will be their Elohim. And David, my servant, shall be king over them and they shall all have one shepherd. They shall also walk in my ordinances and heed my statutes and do them. They shall dwell in the land with your father, with which your fathers dwelt, that I gave to my servant Jacob, and they shall dwell there. They and their children and their children's children forever and ever. My servant David shall be prince over them. And Yahusha has often been called the servant of David, right? So, and we're going to prove that. He will make a covenant with peace with them, establish an everlasting covenant. I will give blessings to them and multiply them and set my sanctuary in the midst of them forevermore. My tabernacle or dwelling place also shall be with them and I will be their Elohim and they shall be my people. Then the nation shall know, understand and realize that I, Yahuwah, do set apart and consecrate Israel for holy use when my sanctuary shall be in their midst forever. So the apostles, the prophets were actually awaiting the restoration of Israel because this is a prophecy that was being, was being prophesied by many prophets, even before Yahusha came. Let's look at Acts chapter 1. Four to nine. And when he had said, even as they were looking at him, he was caught up. He was caught up, right? And a cloud received him and carried him away out of their sight. And while they were gazing intently into heaven as he went, Behold, two men dressed in white robes suddenly stood beside them, who said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing into heaven? The same Yahusha who was caught away and lifted up from among you into heaven will return in just the same way in which you saw him go into heaven. So the same way that he left is the same way that he will return. He will be, and when he returns, all shall see. And I meant to read Acts 4 as well. And while being in their company, let me see if we need to read this one. Acts 1, 4 to 9. Okay. So Acts 1, 4 to 9 is when he was telling them about prophesying about the Holy Spirit. They shall receive the Holy Spirit not many days hence. So that's fine. Then we go to John 18, 33. So we're seeing that the coming of Yahusha is not a secret event number one and we also seeing that what was being prophesied this is what we're starting to see was a restoration of israel so when he comes what is actually going to happen will we go away or will he be coming here on earth to establish his kingdom this is what the scriptures now is going to reveal to us so we read in john 18 33 to 40. Because Yahusha is a king. That is who he is. He is the king of Israel. And he will be coming to reign on the earth. Because what I have learned when I used to believe in the rapture doctrine is that we will be in heaven with him. Right? We will be in heaven. That's where we would go. And we would stay with him in heaven until he comes back. Now for the final judgment. But let us see. He's a king and he was made for that purpose. And a king who, when he came here, he came here and he died on the tree so that we may have the gift of everlasting life. But the purpose of him being a king was not at that time to reign as king on the earth was not for that time. So let us read John 18, 33. Then Pilate entered into the judgment hall again and called Yahushua and said unto him, are you the king of the Yahudim? Yahusha answered him saying, you, saying, say you this thing of yourself or did others tell it you of me? Pilate answered, I am, am I a Yahudi? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you unto me. What have you done? Yahusha answered, Yahusha answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then will my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Yahudim. But now is my kingdom, meaning the Jews, not from hence. Pilate therefore said unto him, Are you a king then? Yahusha said, You say that I am a king. To this end was I born. So there are 
there are, there are prophecies in scripture that have not yet been fulfilled. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that hears the truth, everyone that is of the truth, hears my voice. Pilate said unto him, What is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again with the Yahudim and said unto them, I find in him no fault at all, but ye have a custom that I should release unto you at the Pesach, which is Passover. Will he therefore that I release unto you the king of the Jews, the Yahudim? Then cried they all again, saying, not this man, but Baraba. Baraba, of course, who was a robber. So we are establishing here that Yahusha was born, came into this world to rule as king. But yet when he walked upon this earth, brought truth unto us, brought the gift of salvation unto us, hallelujah, gave us the gift of the Ruach HaKadosh, hallelujah, he has not yet fulfilled or established his role as king on this earth. And that is what will be happening when he returns. Now we see many parts in scripture also where he's called the son of David. You can look in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 to 7, and you can look in Luke 18, 38 to 43. So when we read prophecies about the son of David ruling on this earth, it is, it is actually referring to Yahusha Hamashiach, who is sometimes referred to as the son of David, right? The next question we're going to answer is, will we be here for the tribulation? Will we actually be here for the tribulation? So the pre black rapture tells us that we will not be here for the tribulation. Then we have those who say we'll be here, but only for halfway. And then we have those who say we'll be here for after the tribulation and then we'll be raptured. So in scripture, we see that there is a first three and one half years, which is the prophesying of the two witnesses. We won't be able to read that now, but I've put the scripture so you can check it out. And then we have chosen of his elect will be kept safe in the wilderness for the next three and one half years. Now, because we know from Revelation 11 that the two witnesses, right, they prophesy for three and a half years and they are killed. During that time, it says that they would, they would cause havoc on the earth. Hallelujah. Let me pull up the scripture as we speak, but we won't be reading the scripture. They will cause havoc on the earth. And no matter how they would try to kill them, they will not succeed in killing them because it's not yet their time. And there will be the time when they will be allowed at the end of their testimony, they will be successful in killing them. And the bodies, of course, will lie in the streets. We see that their bodies will lie in the streets according to scripture. And they will give each other gifts, rejoicing over having killed the two witnesses. And after three and a half days, then the Heavenly Father will call them up. And they, of course, they are the ones who are called up to heaven, these two witnesses. We have a video on this channel that says who these two witnesses are. And we have scripture to support that as well. Now, after the two witnesses are killed, we go to Revelation 12. And we won't be expounding on that chapter. So you can check it out in last week's video. And in Revelation 12, it talks about, it talks about, is it Revelation 12 that talks about the next three and one half years? Yes. So it talks about the woman when she goes into the wilderness, right? And the woman represents his chosen, the people that he will choose, his elect, that he will, will, be, will be chosen to go into the wilderness where they will be kept safe. I think I ought to read that verse. Let me see if I can find it. Verse 6, Revelation 12, 6. And the woman fled into the desert, the wilderness, where she had a retreat prepared for her by Elohim, in which she is to be fed and kept safe for 1,260 days, 42 months, or three and one half years. This is what scripture says. So rather than people, greeting Sister Elaine. Welcome, welcome. How are you doing, my dear? Special welcome to you. So rather than people believing that we're all going to be raptured out of here, what's actually going to happen is Yah will be selecting whoever he selects. However he does it, we don't need to know. When the time comes, it, we will all know when the time comes. He has a place prepared for his chosen that goes into the desert in the wilderness where they will be fed. Is that how we believe the scripture or we don't believe it? Now here's the mistake a lot of people, a lot of people make the mistake because of um, certain influences where I've heard where they say the two witnesses are the church, 
the two witnesses are not the church because it says that they will die and it says they will be resurrected. So a lot of people take these things and try to put a spiritual connotation to it when it's not talking about something spiritual, okay? So it's really important for us to understand that when it is not talking about something spiritual, this is not something spiritual. We're given a time frame of three and one half years, fled into the desert, just as the children of Israel were in the desert and Yahuwah fed them. Hallelujah, Sister Elaine said she's okay, praise his name. And Yahuwah fed them for three and a one half years. So will we be here for the tribulation? This, the, the chosen that he has selected, he puts them in the wilderness, sends them into the wilderness, guides them, however, where a retreat is prepared for three and one half years. Hallelujah. And then when we go down, we go into verse 13. We see where, when the dragon realizes, because we have the final casting out of the dragon, right? The final casting out, where he can go no more to accuse the brethren. When the dragon is cast out, we see when he realized that, he goes after the woman in the wilderness, this very same woman, and look, the same three and one half years, who is there for three and one half years, where she will be fed, the scripture says. He goes and he tries to destroy in whatever way he chooses. But the scripture says that water comes out of his mouth, although a dragon breathes fire. I don't know what that means. Don't know everything. But what's important, I always say, we may not get everything right. Right now we see through a glass. We will not get every single thing right. But I think what's important, and I say this to myself all the time, is to just know the prophecy. So that when you see certain things happening, you're like, oh yes, this is what prophecy said. So we may not get every single thing right, in the sense where you know what this is and you know what is this is. And even Yahusha says, we don't need to know the times. Hallelujah. We don't need to know the times. We don't even need to know the order, the exact order of events. It doesn't matter. But when we know, okay, the prophecy and what it means, right? Just as when we went through the scriptures and we saw, okay, as in the days of Noah, as in the days of Lot, what that means, it means that they didn't care. They didn't care at all. Hallelujah. They had no care at all for what was happening. They were just living their life and enjoying their life. But something greater than that was happening at that time. Something greater. Something more serious. Something detrimental. Something that they needed to pay attention to was happening at that time. That they weren't paying attention to. So we don't need to know how all this happens. But we know what the prophecy says. So when the dragon realizes that. The woman is in the wilderness, which represents the chosen that is in the wilderness, not raptured to heaven, in the wilderness. He goes and he spews water. He tries to destroy her, verse 15. Then out of his mouth, look, let me read 14. But the woman was supplied with the two wings of a giant eagle. Do we remember in Exodus 19, 14, when Yahuwah said unto the children of Israel, see, I have bore you on eagle's wings. He'll be doing this again. Just as in Exodus, is it Exodus 19.4, I believe. He will be doing this again. Bear you on a giant eagle. So the chosen, those that he has chosen, will be in the wilderness. And I'm saying that this will be people who keep the commandments of Elohim and have the testimony of Yahushua Mashiach. You have to have both. Well, that's so that she might fly from the presence of the serpent into the desert, the wilderness, to the retreat where she is to be kept safe and fed for a time and times and half a time, three and one half years. Then out of his mouth, the serpent spouted forth water like a flood after the woman that she might be carried off with the torment. So the serpent tried to destroy her, but the earth came to the rescue of the woman and the ground opened its mouth and swallowed up the stream of water which the dragon had spouted from his mouth. And then what happens after when he realizes he doesn't succeed? So then the dragon was furious, enraged at the woman, and he went away to wage war on the remainder of her descendants, on those who obey Elohim's commandments and who have the testimony of Yahusha HaMashiach and adhere to it and bear witness to him. I'm sorry for the picture here. This is so disgusting. I'm really sorry for that picture. It's not my website. Now, how could that be on a, a Bible website? Tell me about it. And the picture is not going. I'm really, really, my apologies for that. I didn't even see it. My mind was so much on what I was doing. I didn't see the picture till now. So I don't even know how long it has been like that. Forgive me. Oh. 
So we see that when the dragon was not successful, um, attacking those people that would be in the wilderness where Yahuwah keeps them safe, he goes after the, the descendants, the remainder who obey Elohim's commandments and have the testimony of Yahushua Mashiach. Do not ask me why some will be remaining. I cannot answer that. I am giving my own assumption now. Maybe some people would just not believe. That's why Yahusha, when he said the scripture about um, the escape and he that is on the housetop, when it's time to escape, don't go down for anything in your house. And if you look back, you would, it would be like the Lot's wife. So maybe when the, the call comes to leave for those to be safe, there will be saints that maybe will not leave. I don't know. They would just not believe because maybe they're waiting for rapture. I don't know. Yes, they believe in Elohim the same way. They have the commandments. They believe in Yahusha, but they're waiting for rapture. Or they just don't believe. I don't know. I cannot answer that. But some will remain. I cannot answer that. But I'm just saying what the scripture says. The scripture says that there will be some of his elect that will be in a wilderness, in the wilderness where they will be kept safe. Now, I'm saying this based on what we've read. And based on the pattern in the scriptures with the two, with how Yahuwah works, when he sends his prophets, he always sends his prophets to warn. Is that true or false? That is true. So I, am, I strongly believe, and this is my belief, right? I'm sharing now from my inference from the scriptures. I strongly believe that the two witnesses will be given this warning will be letting people know at a certain point in time that they have to make this trend. I strongly believe this. Why? Because always according to the pattern of Yahuwah, he made, his, he made known his ways unto Moses. Based on his pattern, he always sends his prophets to warn. Just like Aaron and Moses. Just as he sends Jeremiah. Just as he sends Ezekiel. He always sends his prophets to warn, to instruct. So that's how what I believe. I believe he will send those two witnesses will have a primary role to play at a certain point in time of the prophesying to instruct Elohim's people. And that is why it's written in Matthew and Luke that when, when it's time to leave, do not look back. Wherever you are, two cities, if, if you're in a house stop, don't even come down to go take what's in the house. Go. Just go. That is what I believe, right? I just share that there based on my understanding of what the scripture has actually written regarding those in the wilderness and those that are left in the cities there to the end the dragon goes back to make war to make war with all those who are left so this which means these people are not in that place where the people are safe kept safe by yahuwah these people are safe from the serpent it says in the scripture these people are out there in the world they some will be martyred according to the scripture but the blood of the martyrs is precious unto Yahuwah. Will we be here during the Great Tribulation? That's what, we, that's what we're looking at now. So during the second half of the three and a half years, so you have the first three and a half years. In the second three and a half years, the Antichrist is allowed to have, to have power over the saints, which is during that very same time. So when it says the dragon goes back after the remainder at the end of Revelation chapter 12, he goes back now because he will be he will have the authority. He will have the he will, he's allowed now to, to put it bluntly. He's allowed now to overpower the saints during this last three and a half years. And let's look at that really quickly in Revelation chapter 13. We may have to cover this in two parts. So Revelation chapter 13. where we're looking at the Antichrist because we want to establish, will we be raptured out of here and not be here for the tribulation? So what we're seeing instead in the scripture is some of his saints, those who hearken to the call, will be, and he has chosen, will be in the wilderness. And we're seeing that many will be remaining wherever they are and the dragon goes after them. What happens when the dragon goes after them? Bearing in mind that he cannot touch those that he tried to kill in the wilderness. So what happens? Revelation chapter 13. I stood on the sandy beach. I saw a beast coming out of the sea. And it talks about that beast and the horns and the seven heads and the dragon giving power unto that beast. And we're going to come down here to verse 4. They fell down. The whole earth went after the beast in amazement and admiration. And they fell down and paid homage to the dragon because he had bestowed on the beast all his dominion and authority. 
They also praise and worship the beast, exclaiming, who is a match for the beast and who can make war against him? And the beast was given the power of speech, uttering boastful and blasphemous words. And he was given freedom to exert his authority and to exercise his will during 42 months and three and a half or three and a half years. So we're seeing that the whole earth, except those who, whose names are written in the book of life, will be worshipping the beast, this antichrist. Now, um, do you know that the Muslim religion, they have a messiah coming, they believe in for a messiah. Do you know that the Hindu religion, they too have believed in for a messiah. One of these days we'll do a short video on that as well. In their belief, they too are waiting for this messiah. So when this false Christ comes, this false Christ will be received by them because they're waiting for their false messiah. Christy Johnson says, thank you for sharing. These are things that are heavy on my heart to watch and pray for understanding. Hallelujah. Thank you for being here, Christy. Blessing to you. And I encourage you always when I'm, when I'm through, pray on it and go back and study the scriptures. And you definitely see this is what the scripture is saying. Thank you so much. May Yah bless you richly, Christy, Christy Johnson. So we see here also um, that the Antichrist is given the power of speech. Oh, I didn't read four. They fell down, paid homage to the dragon, so they worshiped the dragon. And that is why I said a time of satanic worship, which we see they're becoming more satanic openly, is coming. We don't rejoice. But it's common sense. It ain't get ugly yet. So they would, they paid homage to the dragon because he had bestowed on the beast all his dominion and authority. They also praise and worship the beast, exclaiming, who is a match for the beast and who can make war against him? And the beast was given the power of speech. Remember we talk about the blasphemous words by that king in Isaiah chapter 14, whom they say was Satan, but is not. And the blasphemous words by the other king in Ezekiel 28, whom they also say was Satan, but is not. But they are people who are empowered by Satan. Just as this Antichrist, the Antichrist will be empowered by Satan to utter boastful and blasphemous words, just as Nimrod. And he was given freedom to exert. Of course, we know the freedom is because Elohim must now allow, allow this to exert his authority and to exercise his will for the three and one half years. I hope you're getting the picture, saints. We have the two witnesses, the first three and a half years. They die, and it's like it marks a timeline, the next three and one and a half years. And that is why it says, for the elect's sake, the days are shortened. I used to think, now there are some things I may come back and say, hey, you know, I got this wrong. I, I don't have a problem doing that. Honestly, I really try to remain humble. Just a while ago, I think I mixed up myself. I have to go back, go that back over because I did that this morning, probably too in a hurry. But I have to go that over still. And if there's anything I said wrong, I'll come back. But anyway, um, what my point I wanted to make is, I forgot the point I was going to make. Oh, Elohim, send it back to me. I forgot the point I was going to make. It will come back to me. But what I want us to understand is to see the picture. According to scripture, forget, you have to forget your tradition and what you've learned and just see what is the scripture saying. We have the two witnesses in the three and one half years. They die. Right. Thank you, Father. This is what I wanted to say. I used to think that when he says for the elect's sake, the days will be shortened. I used to think it literally meant maybe a shorter day. So instead of the day being 24 hours, it would be like 18 or whatever as an example. I used to think like the day would be literally shortened and my computer is dying. But it was when I was doing this, it was when I was doing this Bible study, preparing for this, when I was engaging in this Bible study, that Yahuwah revealed it in, into my spirit. What it actually means that the days, for the elect's sake, the days are shortened. For the elect's sake, why is it not charging still? One second. For the elect's sake, it means the reign of the antichrist the reign of the antichrist because let me tell you saints what we see now by the enemy in the world the infiltration i'll try not to go on too long but i have to say some things what we see going on in the world it's not ugly yet it's going to get uglier 
And when certain things have happened in scripture that we see here, we don't need to know timeline, but we would see it happen because scripture is true. It was prophesied, Yahusha will come. The prophets prophesied it. Moses spoke it. It was prophesied. And Yahusha was born and conceived by the Holy Spirit. He walked upon the earth. He did his works. And on the tree, he said, it is done. It happened. So what we read, there are other prophecies that are yet to happen. And it doesn't matter how long it takes. We will not be like some that say, oh, it's a long time. We will be, we gird our loins. We make ourselves ready. I want to encourage you at this point in time. Hallelujah. I want to encourage you and I to make ourselves ready. Do you know there's a part in scripture? I couldn't share everything. There's a part in scripture. If you Google it, you could get the verse. It says, where Yahusha says, pray that you be counted worthy to escape the things that shall come to pass. And we read now in Revelation chapter 12 about those who will be escaping. Right? They will be escaping and be kept safe for three and one half years. So for the elixir, and it says when the enemy tried to attack them, he will not succeed. So he goes with a fury after the remnant, wherever they are in the world. And now Elohim has given the enemy, uh, uh, he's allowed him to now go and overpower the saints. Just as when it was time, he allowed him, you have your way with Job, but don't kill him right? But for the elect's sake, because of his elect, because Elohim loves her, his people, that time will be three and one half years. It will not be a hundred years of the enemy killing the saints. That is what, if I'm wrong, if you think I'm wrong, it's fine. You could put it in the comments, but at least that's what Elohim put on my heart when I was doing this Bible study. I realized, hey, because I used to think that the day would literally be shortened. But coming to understand this now, I realize it's the time. When he said that day will be short, and he's speaking to the time factor. The time is short. The reign of the Antichrist is actually a short period of time. It's a short time. It's the last march of the enemy. His last fury. Because when you read afterwards in Revelation, you don't hear nothing about the devil again until he's bounded for a thousand years. It's plagues. It's judgment. And let me continue. But do you see what I'm saying? Hallelujah. Christy Johnson is saying, I agree with this understanding. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you for sharing. Amen. So he's allowed to reign for three and one half years. I want to read the book of Daniel chapter 7 now, 19 to 27. Daniel. Nineteen. And it says. So we're talking about this antichrist, right? Then I wish to know the truth about the fourth beast, beast which was different. Oh, I'm not sharing my screen. I hope we have no old pictures coming up. Which was different from all the others, exceedingly terrible and shocking, whose teeth were of iron and his nails of bronze, which devoured, broke and crushed and trampled what was left with its feet. And about the 10 horns representing kings that were on its head and the other horn, which came up later and before which three of the other horns fell, the horn which had eyes and a mouth that spoke great things, which looked greater than the others. And as I looked, this horn made war with the saints. So Daniel prophesied this, that Yahusha came again and gave to John in Revelations, Yokahonon, his name. He prophesied this, that this Antichrist will make war with the saints and prevail over them. Until the ancient of days came and judgment was given to the saints of the most high Elohim. And the time came when the saints possessed the kingdom. Hallelujah. Thus the angel said, the fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on earth, which will be different from all the other kingdoms. And it shall devour the whole earth and tread it down and break it in pieces and crush it. And as for the ten horns out of his, this kingdom, ten kings shall arise. And another shall arise after them, and it shall be different from the former ones. And he shall subdue and put down three kings. And he shall speak words against the most high Yahuwah, which we see in Revelations 13, the blasphemy. And shall wear out the saints of the most high. The wear out the saints is how he'll over, overpower them. And think to change the time of sacred feasts 
and holy days and the law. And we've seen this happen. And this is going to happen again, right? This is going to happen again. The, the Catholic Church went about changing. They've changed the Shabbat to the Sunday, right? They've, they've um, written this edict of Constantine and have made it the Sunday. And we know we have the months of the year and all the different months of the years have how many different days. And they've changed up everything. We know in the scripture the months are given, the days of the number of days of the months are given, you know, and they've given us the months after pagan Elohims and days after the pagan El um, Elohim and so on and so forth. But this is going to happen again because there are laws that are going to come that is going to change things around. I believe that very much that they might ban Shabbat. I believe that is coming. That one is my mind, right? But I believe that this one might be coming. And the saint shall be given into his hand for a time, two times and a half a time, three and one half years again. But the judgment shall be set. So we see here the three and one half years. Where, look at verse 25. He shall wear out the saints. This aligns with Revelation chapter 13 that we just read. He will wear out the saints. For which time? For only three and one half years. So when it says the days are shortened, it talks about the time being shortened. It talks about the rain where he will be able to wear out and overpower the saints will be a short time. But the judgment shall be set by the court of the Most High and they shall take away his dominion to gradually, to consume it gradually and to destroy it suddenly in the end. And the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heavens shall be given to the people of the saints. This is our end. Hallelujah. And we come into that of the most high his kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and all the dominion shall serve and obey him hallelujah hallelujah never considered never considered it from this position thank you sister hallelujah hallelujah oops i'm going to change the verse hallelujah thank you so much brother steel head of Fred. thank you so much for sharing so now we're going to go to, we've established the Antichrist allow, will be allowed to overpower the saints and he will be, over, be allowed to overpower them for only three and one half years. We've established that, right? Then Christy Johnson is saying the Sharia, the Sharia law is next. You know, you I, I have been pondering on this as well, right? Because... And that's something I want to study more before I speak openly on it. But I'll just share my thoughts. I'm not 100% sure yet. But um, I have a strong feeling that we're going to see a rise in the Muslim religion around the world. I have a very, very strong feeling about that, the way things are going. But I will speak about that at a later time because this is an area I want to go and study a little more. And I remember I was listening to someone some years ago and he was talking about the tradition. I don't know if this is true, but he was talking about the tradition with um, when people weep and they, the way they put the ashes and thing on their head is a, a Muslim tradition, something to do with revelations in the book of revelations with um, when they would be mourning the great, great highlight of Babylon when she's destroyed. But I can't speak to that right now, but Sonia, as I'm seven, okay. I'll see, I'll see what that is. But that's definitely something that I have been pondering and feeling in my spirit, something to do with the Muslims rising. I've been feeling that in my spirit, especially with Palestine now being um, established as a state in the United Nations. And that was not even something that was mentioned on the news in the sense where it is on the news so that it sticks in your head. They just had that once or twice and it was gone. Whether you and approve for Palestine to become a nation but we're going to go into that. Don't worry. Thank you for getting me to understand this, the scriptures. Hallelujah, Sister Elaine. And we have further to go. And if we can't cover, cover all tonight, I will ask you all with permission if you all want me to have a next part. Because we have further to go, deeper to go. I think we have about six slides left, but it's deep on each slide. So depending on the time, if you, we can do some in part two, it's fine. So let's look at the last point on this slide. When he talks about keeping safe, with the three and the second three and a half years, there will be saints that he has chosen. Yahusha says, I'm going to just Google that. Because I think I ought to say it. So that you can refer to it. Luke 21, 36. Pray that he be counted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass. 
So I pray that prayer and I tell my children, hey, there's no shame in praying that prayer if Yahusha say that. Because we are a follower of him. We are his disciples. Hallelujah. We follow him. If he says, pray that you be accounted worthy to escape, I pray that prayer. Father, let us be accounted worthy. And that would require us to be ready to read his word, to worship him in spirit and in truth, to stand on faith, to have the armor of Elohim, to walk in the love of Mashiach, to love Yahuwah with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. It's not a matter of just praying the prayer and that's it. It requires things of us. Hallelujah. But we can do those things by his Holy Spirit. We cannot do it for ourselves, only by his Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. So now we're talking about that safety that we read about in Revelation chapter 12, where the church will be safe for three and one half years. And there is something here where people talk about rapture, believe in rapture because of what's written in Revelation chapter 3, verse 7, about the church of Philadelphia, not understanding what the safety means. So let's read the Revelation chapter 3, 7 to 13. And that's why I was saying when we study scriptures, we cannot read a verse in isolation and say, this is what it means to me, right? Because always scripture confirms scripture. I have seen in studying the scriptures, you read this one place, and I'm sure you have been seeing this following me in this Bible study and many other Bible studies, and you go back into the prophets, and you go into the Torah, and it aligns here, and it aligns there. Hallelujah. So Revelation chapter 3, verse 7. After this, I saw in the night visions, and behold, oh no, I think I'm still in Daniel. Yes. Revelation 3, verse 7. And to the angel, the messenger of the assembly church in Philadelphia, write, These are the words of the Holy One, the true one, he who has the key of David, who opens and no one shall shut, who shuts and no one shall open. I know your record of works and what you are doing. See, I have set before you a door open wide, which no one is able to shut. I know that you have but little power, and yet you have kept my word. And guarded my message. We have to keep the word of Elohim in our heart and live by it. And guard his message. His message is the prophecy that he has given us. The word that he has given us. Hallelujah. And have not renounced or denied my name. Even this too, I want to encourage those of you. You have come to the knowledge of his name. Or have not come to it, but you've heard it. Do not deny his name. He has a name. He was given a title by men. A pagan title pagan words but he has a holy name take note i will make those of the synagogue of satan who say they are jews and are not but are lie behold i will make them come and bow down before your feet and learn and acknowledge that i have loved you because you have guarded and kept my word of patient endurance hallelujah have held fast the lesson of my patience with the expectant endurance that I give you. Endure, saints. Whatever you're going through, endure. Be patient and hold fast to his, his word. I also will keep you safe from the hour of trial, testing, which is to come upon the whole earth. Those who dwell upon the earth. I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have so that no one may rob you and deprive you of your crown. One save, always save is not true. You can be deprived of your crown. That's why we have to hold fast and guard. He who overcomes is victorious. I will make him a pillar in the sanctuary of my Elohim. He shall never be put out of it or go out of it. And I will write on him the name of my Elohim and the name of the city of my Elohim, the new Jerusalem, which descends from my Elohim out of heaven and my own new name. He also will be given a new name, Yahusha. Hallelujah. He who can hear, let him listen to and heed what the Spirit says to the assemblies, churches. So we see where he talk about in verse 10. I also will keep you safe from the hour of trial, testing, which is to come on the whole world to try those who dwell upon the earth. And that hour of trial is the great tribulation. The great tribulation is an hour of trial. That's what the great tribulation is. It's an hour of trial to come on the whole world. And Yahuwah is merciful and good. And for his elect sake, that time 
will be shortened. It will not be a lengthy, lengthy, lengthy time, a lengthy span of time. It will be shortened for his elect's sake. So now we have seen that we will be here for the tribulation. And it is contrary. What the, what the rapture doctrine is teaching is contrary to what is in scripture, that we will not be here. Is Yahusha's return a secret? Now, we've already established this. If you want, I will go through this really, really fast. I think we did Acts 1, 4 to 9 already, where they all stood gazing. We did this already, so we don't need to go through this. I believe we read that scripture. Where they all stood gazing, and the angel said unto him, what are you looking at? The same way in which he left is the same way that he will return. They stood, they saw, they saw him, the disciples, the chosen that were there, they saw him, they saw him leave. And we know from scripture, having what, what we've read already earlier, that the lightning will be flashed from one end of the heaven to another. The whole world will know. Hallelujah. The whole world will know. I have a scripture here from Jasher. And I think, yes, because I was reading on the internet when I was researching, where some people said, okay, let me just get the scripture first. Um, from the Apocrypha, I should say. So the Apocrypha supports the Torah, supports the scripture. So Josh, Joshua chapter 6. So there are some accounts in the scripture. When you look in the Apocrypha, it, it gives you a deeper um, backdrop. So even like in the time of Nimrod, when you read the Apocrypha, for those of you who saw um the unmasking satan series and i talked about lucifer part one you would see the deep backdrop that we got in the book of jasher on what they actually did and how terrible it was so in the book of jasher chapter six i don't think i'll read the whole chapter it, it, it tells about when noah built the ark and we know about the animals going in into the ark two by two, and we know about the clean and how many of the unclean will go in and all of that. I'm going to just scroll down. And let me see here. And all the animals from verse 10, and all the animals and beasts and fowls were still there, and they surrounded the ark at every place, and the rain had not descended till seven days after. And on that day, which we saw also in Genesis, that was seven days, and on that day, Yahuwah caused the whole earth to shake, and the sun darkened. So we remember Yahusha talked that the coming of the son of man is like the days of Noah, right? So in the days of Noah, there was an earthquake. In the days of Noah, the sun was darkened and the foundations of the world raged and the whole earth was moved violently and the lightning flashed. And it's obvious that there was an earthquake because remember the deep was open, right? The deep was open. So that's normal. Now, we cannot understand that. I submit to Yahuwah. There are some things that I would never understand. He is the Elohim over all the earth. He has formed the earth and the foundation thereof. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Christy Johnson says, this is the patience of the saints to endure. Indeed. Indeed. Hallelujah. We have to endure and encourage one another. Any opportunity you get to encourage one another, encourage each other, because we all need it from, some, from time to time. We need that encouragement. Hallelujah. So then it says here that the, the earth was moved violently and the lightning flashed and the thunder roared and all the fountains in the earth were broken up. So yes, the deep was open, yes, such as was not known to the inhabitants before. And Elohim did this mighty act in order to terrify the sons of men that there might be no more evil upon the earth, right? And still the sons of men would not return from the evil ways. And this does not surprise me. We can't read the scripture tonight, but when we will cover the book of Revelation series, I want us to do that. When we will cover that book of Revelation series, we would see that when the plagues start to come upon the earth after the time of the Antichrist, after the Antichrist, Antichrist have his reign, right? And we see the last fury of the dragon. When the plagues start to come upon the earth, it says that they will blaspheme the Elohim of the heaven. They will still not repent. So it is no surprise that even in the days of Noah, when there is such a great earthquake that the, uh, that the inhabitants of the earth at that time had never seen before, right? Had never, ever seen before. And, it, and the sun darkened and all this taking place, the mighty work of Elohim taking place. Still, it is no surprise that they didn't even repent of their evil ways. Because we see this very same thing is going to reoccur in the book of Revelations. 
And yes, such as was not known to the inhabitants before, and Elohim did this right. And still the sons of men will not return from their evil ways. And they increased the anger of Yahuwah at that time and did not even direct their hearts to all this. And at the end of seven days, in the 600th year of the life of Noah, and we read that too in Genesis chapter 6, I think, or 7, it says it's the 600th year of his life, the waters of the flood were upon the earth, and all the fountains of the deep were broken up, and the windows of heaven were open, and the rain was upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights. And Noah and his household and all the living creatures that were with him came into the ark on account of the waters of the flood, and Yahuwah shut him in. And all the sons of men that were left upon the earth became exhausted through evil on account of the rain. So when they see the rain start to come down, the waters start to, because remember the flood didn't just happen, boom. It's over a period of time, period of time, right? So the rain kept falling, the rain kept falling, the waters rising. They became exhausted for the waters were coming more violently upon the earth and the animals and beasts were still surrounding the ark. And the sons of men assembled together about 700,000 men and women. And they came unto Noah to the ark. And they called to Noah saying, open for us that we may come to you in the ark. And wherefore shall we die? And Noah with a loud voice answered them from the ark saying, have we not all rebelled against Yahuwah and said that he does not exist? And therefore Yahuwah brought upon you this evil to destroy and cut you off from the face of the earth. Is not this the thing that I spoke to you of 120 years aback? And you would not hearken to the voice of Yahuwah. And now do you desire to live upon the earth? Because it took him a long time to build the ark. And that I was, that's why I was saying we cannot naively think that when he was building, if I begin to build an ark outside my yard, to think that, yes, they don't care, but they, they're seeing, but they don't care, but they are seeing that it was being built. Right, And he would have shared the word with whoever he shared the word with. But their hearts are wicked and Yahuwah has already appointed who will be saved. Right, And he said to Noah, we are ready to return to Yahuwah. Only open for us that we may live and not die. And Noah said unto them, behold, now that you see the trouble of your souls, you wish to return to Yahuwah. Why did you not return during these 120 years, which Yahuwah granted you as the determined period? But now you come and tell me this on account of the troubles of your souls. Now also Yahuwah will not listen to you. Neither will he give air to you on this day so that you will not now succeed in your wishes. So we see here that just in the days of Noah, right? They didn't care. The sun was darkened, great earthquake. They didn't care. We're going to see the very same thing replicate when the time of Yahusha return comes. They'll be living their life. Because remember, let me just say this too. The mark of the beast, we are going to go through some hard times. And don't think I'm saying this to make it sound like, why is something to, it would be so wonderful. It would be a challenge. It's, it, would be, it would be rough. Because they will make it rough. Because when that mark comes, they will make it seem like this is the way to have a better life. You can't buy or sell unless you have the mark. It is the way to a better life. I want to say something to you, saints. Do you believe in Elohim? Do you believe, I don't expect you to answer this, I know you do, right? Do you believe that there is nothing that he cannot do? And I'm not saying this in ignorance. I'm not saying that you, we are living our life without wisdom. I am saying all this just to say what is important right now as part of our preparation is to build up in the most holy faith. We need to build our faith and keep building it. Yahusha says he gives every, unto every man a measure of faith and keep building that faith and keep building that faith in his word. Because I believe, I believe, depending on our relationship with Elohim, hallelujah, depending on our walk with Elohim, we will have a measure of grace and protection. He will, if you have to dream and tell you, well, you know what? You need to stock up for six months. Fine. I'm not, he will guide you, but do not walk in fear. No matter what we are going to see coming before us. It is important when you see this begin to pass certain laws to go on your knees and pray. I'm telling it to you because I try to do it too. Let us go on our knees and pray. 
when we see it begin to come to pass, different tribulations, different, different challenges. Amen. Christy Johnson says he can do all things. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He will feed you. I have never seen the righteous forsaken or his seed begging bread. You see, when I came into the faith as a Christian many, many years ago, this rapture, this, they, teach you, they, they teach you fair. And rapture was the hope. And I can never forget, I shared this last week when my mom said to me many, many years ago, but it's a girl, there's no rapture. She didn't tell me anything else. And for two weeks, I was broken in my heart. There's no rapture. There's no rapture. If there's no rapture, what's the hope? What's the hope? I was really young in the faith then. And I went and prayed on my face before Elohim. Father, show me the truth in according to the scripture. Father, show me the truth. You know, it's a journey with him. We get some, we get this right. He dismantled this lie. He dismantled this deception. Another one. It's a, a journey because he's the way, the truth. All truth is in Yahusha. All truth. Hallelujah. And that's why he leads us into all truth. And right now we see through a glass. And the time will come when we'll see him as he is. So, and Elohim revealed it to me by his scripture. That's how he revealed it to me. And he took away the fear because I had fear. I was actually walking and living my life in fear. And rapture was my hope. And we have to understand that is believing in a lying prophecy that will never come to pass. And it is an act of the enemy because we see from the scriptures, Yahusha comes in the cloud. We're not even finished. But we're going to talk next about what happens when we caught up. So I don't want to talk too much. What happens when we caught up? What happens when we meet him in the air? Right? Before I get ahead of myself. So is Yahusha's return a secret? No. All shall see him. Hallelujah. All shall see him. We've seen that in some of the scriptures that we've read already. And I have some on the screen that you can take down and that you can read. And um, I think it's important, since this is just one verse, Mark chapter 14. I think it's important for me to read it. 55, I won't read all of it, but only the verse that will say all shall see him. Mark, I'm in Matthew 14. Um, right. And it says, verse 62, when Yahusha was before the priest, and he says, and he says, and Yahusha said, I am, when he asked, are you, are you Hamashiach? That means the anointed one, the son of the blessed. And Yahusha said, I am. And you shall see the son of Adam sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of glory. You shall see him. He's telling him that they all will see him. Let's read one last scripture to prove. Remember, scripture confirms scripture. This one we have to read. Revelations 1, 7. Behold, he comes with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. He comes with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all the kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. So Yahusha's return is not a secret. Now, what happens when the saints are caught up? They will see the son of Adam coming in the clouds with power and great glory. And we read it in all these different verses. Some we had not read. Colossians 3, 1 Thessalonians 4, even Jude 1, 14 to 15, talks about him coming in the power of his glory. You can check this out when you go back to do your Bible story. So what happens is that he comes. So we 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 know that it will not be a secret event. The lightning flash on the, uh, from across the skies, the sun darkened. We know all these things that shall happen. But we now, we meet him in the air. I think I have to do justice. Rather than thinking of the time, I think I have to do justice here and read the scripture. Because I think I'm thinking of the time and... It will not be right. I'm trying to share my screen. Where is the screen I had? Oh, there it is. Okay. So let us look at it really quickly. Matthew 24, only one verse. And we are... 
Okay, so we've already read Matthew 24, so we'll go to Colossians. We read Matthew 24 earlier, where all shall see him coming in his power and glory. So Colossians chapter 3, verse 4 only. When Mashiach, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in the splendor of his glory. So we know that we will be putting on the incorruptible. Hallelujah. We will be transformed. Let's go to 1 Thessalonians. Chapter 4. Verse 13 to 18. Now also we would not have you ignorant brethren about those who fall asleep in death. Because you know when we die in Mashiach, we sleep. When we die in this physical body that they call death. That you may not grieve for them as the rest do who have no hope beyond the grave. Hallelujah. For since we believe that Yahusha died and rose again, even so Yahuwah will also bring with him through Yahusha those who have fallen asleep in death. For this we declare to you by the Adonai's word that we who are alive and remain until the coming of Yahusha shall in no way proceed into his presence or have any advantage at all over those who have previously fallen asleep in him in death. So whoever is alive, so let's just assume if I'm not the saying that I know when he's coming, using an example, let's just assume that Yahusha is returning in the next 50 years as an example. Whoever is alive in that time, whether I'll be an elderly person, you know, <laughs> whoever is alive in that time will not precede those who have fallen asleep, right? At that at the time of his coming, for Yahusha himself will descend. That is an important word here for those who will believe in the rapture. It didn't say that we meet him in the air and then we go back to heaven. Because if we go back to heaven and then we come in again, that's three comings. That's two comings, sorry. That is two comings. He has come, right? We're taking his church away, go to heaven. They live with him in heaven, and then he comes again. That is two comings, but it only talks of one coming right now. One coming, that's what we're looking for. That one coming, that one event. So that's why it's important to understand what the scripture is saying. So he will descend. So when he comes, the Yahusha himself will descend from heaven. He will descend when we see that the skies, the clouds roll back as a scroll. Hallelujah. The clouds roll back as a scroll and all shall see him. And remember those that will mourn. It's the wicked and the unrighteous. They will mourn. These are the tears that have been amongst us all this time. They will mourn. They will grieve. But he will descend. He himself, the scripture says here, will descend from heaven with a loud cry of summons. Now, what is summon? Summoning. Let me just put the meaning for us here. A summoning. To order someone to come up or to be present at a particular place or to officially arrange a meeting of people, Cambridge Dictionary. So the loud cry of summon, when he appears in the cloud, the cry of summoning is for the dead who are physically dead in their body, but asleep. That is the correct term for those who are in Mashiach. We are asleep when we die. But these that are asleep to rise, that is the summoning, to rise and to meet him in the air. So he will descend from heaven with a loud cry of summons, with the shout of an archangel and with the blast of the trumpet, the shofar of Elohim. And those who have departed this life in Mashiach will rise first. They will rise first. Then we, the living ones who remain on the earth, shall simultaneously be caught up along with the resurrected dead in the clouds to meet Yahuwah in the air. And so always through the eternity of the eternities, we shall be with Yahuwah. Now, many people misinterpret the verse 17, because if you, again, if we read scripture in isolation, we will misinterpret it. If we just read verse 17 as verse 17, we misinterpret it. If we did not do all the Bible study we just did to understand what this means. So with that summoning, that loud cry that, we, that will be sound, will be a summoning that the, those that are asleep will hear. They will hear. They will know. They will be quickened by the Ruach HaKadosh that quickens. They will be quickened and they will resurrect and they will meet him in the air. And we now who are alive at that time will meet 
Yahuwah, and when it says, so shall we ever be with Yahuwah, then this is our time, hallelujah, where it is over. We will cry no more, that we will weep no more. To the eternities of eternities. Then he has come. It says Yahuwah, Yahusha himself in verse 16 shall descend from heaven. He is coming. We established previously in today's message that he is a king. He's the king of Israel. Now he is descending. When he came upon the earth, he did not yet walk in his, his how to say, his authority of as king. In the sense where he's established his rule on the earth. And that was the expectation we went through tonight for the scriptures of the apostles and the prophets. Because they knew of the prophecy of the restoration of Israel, of the king coming back to rule on Israel. Why they asked him, is this the time? Is this now the time, I think, in the book of Acts when they asked him, when thou shalt restore Israel? And he said, it is not appointed for you to know the times. And then he told him about, he told the disciples about the Ruach HaKadosh coming. Hallelujah. So he's coming, he is descending to now establish his reign on earth and we will forever be with him. We're getting somewhere. When he comes now, we have a scripture now in Jude 1, before we close off this last, this, this thought here, we're going to the book of Jude chapter 1, only two verses, verse 14 to 15, and it says, It was of these people, moreover, that Enoch in the seventh generation from Adam prophesied when he said, now, I had a dream recently, and I'm dreaming. So people were coming to kill me, and they had cutlasses. Oh, they were coming to kill me. And I'm, I'm escaping. My family was with me and other people with me, and we're escaping. And they're hot, searching, searching, searching. It's like we're hiding, escaping, hiding. And then I met this tall, tall, tall man. And then he showed me this lady and said, her name is Minerva. And she gave me the book of Enoch and said, the escape is in there. I've been praying about it. I don't know what it means yet. The escape is in there. So I don't know if there is a particular message. I don't know if there is a particular message because remember, we have been taught certain things by our, I'm not going to this now, but the prophets, they read the book of Enoch. They read his writing. The prophets, they talked about Enoch. So there is some message in there maybe pertaining to the end of time because in the book of Enoch, it starts by saying that this writing is for those in the times of the end. So there is probably some message in there. When Yahuwah has revealed it unto me, I will share it. So anyway, and he says, to, what it was of these people moreover that Enoch in the seventh generation from Adam prophesied when he said, Behold, Yahusha comes with his myriads of holy ones, ten thousands of his saints, to execute judgment upon all and to convict all the impious unholy ones of all the ungodly deeds which they have committed in such an ungodly way and of all the severe, abusive, jarring things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. They're going to pay. What I want you to understand, which is something that I misunderstood some years ago, is that Hallelujah. Let me see. Yes, I wasn't seeing the comments. Forgive me. <laughs> Hallelujah. Little by little, precept upon precept. Amen, Christy Johnson. Hallelujah. All eyes shall see him, even those who pierced him. Hallelujah. Dr. Sister Elaine is saying, Dr. Melissa, you can't wash the wood. Yes, Sister Elaine. So I'm trying to remind myself of that. Thanks for saying it. Even if we don't cover all tonight and we have to do a part two. I'll have to do it that way because washing it, I, I, I want to do justice. Do it right. Hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, they did. Yes. So um, I want to say here that the book of Enoch, he from, from more of that Enoch in the seventh generation of Adam prophesied. So there was a prophecy of Enoch that is hidden from us because they told us don't read it. But there is a bad book, Enoch book. So there is, you have to have this sermon that Yahuwah guide you. Because remember, in the line of Cain, there is an Enoch. When you go back through in Genesis, you notice they named the children the same names for a certain while. Enoch, Enos. You know, there is this parallel. So you have to be really careful, of course. But there is the Enoch who prophesied on about, and we have this book actually, about Yahusha returning. He prophesied a lot about the Messiah's coming and coming with 10,000 of his saints. But what is he coming to do? 
This is going to align with what we've just read in Thessalonians. Yahusha himself shall descend. Now, yes, this is where I was getting to. What the mistake that I made years ago, and many people make still, is that we, we put the coming of Yahusha and the final day of judgment as one event when it is when these are two separate events. So when Yahusha comes, yes, there is judgment, but it is not the last day of judgment because the day of judgment of Yahuwah is at the end when you have the second resurrection. And it says, woe to them that will take part in that second resurrection because it's, already, it's like it's already sealed for them. They know where they're going, but now they have to hear the judgment and the judgment will be severe. Right, and we're going to be talking about that next. That's coming the day of judgment. I think we have to go over that next. But when Yahusha comes, right, is saying here in Jude, why is he coming with his sins to execute judgment upon all? Isn't there a psalm where he will bind them with nobles and his kings with fetters of iron? There's a psalm bind them with nobles with chains. And the kings with fetters of iron. This is about Yahusha's return. I just remember the psalm. Let me see if I can find it real quick. Psalm 149. So we have to look at that psalm because that psalm tells us, that psalm aligns with what we are reading here in the book of Jude. That he's going to execute judgment on all and to convict all the impious unholy ones of their ungodly deeds, which they have committed in such an ungodly way. And what else is happening in Yahusha's return? When he returns, there will be war in the valley of Jehoshaphat. Let us talk about that war. We're going to the book of Joel now. Hallelujah. So there are two wars. I wasn't taught this before. I used to only believe one. But there are two wars. There is the war in the valley of Jehoshaphat. But there is also another war because when Yahusha returns, I even forgot, did I include it? Yes, I did. Thank you, Father. That Satan will be bounded. The enemy will be bounded for a thousand years. When he is loosed, he then goes to rally to make another war. So there are two wars. It's two events. So now we're looking at Joel chapter 33. Joel 3. There it is. 1 to 18. The word of Elohim came to Joel, the son of Pethuel. Sorry, I'm have to share my screen. Hear this, you aged men, and give air all you inhabitants of the land. Has such a thing as this occurred in your days of, or even in the days of your fathers? Tell your children of it, and let your children tell their children, and their children another generation, what the calling locusts left. The swarming locusts has eaten. And what the swarming locust left, the hopping locust has eaten. And what the hopping locust left, the stripping locust has eaten. And wake you drunkards. That song like plagues. And weep, wail, all you drinkers of wine, because of the fresh sweet juice of the grape. For it is cut off and removed from your youth. For a heathen and hostile nation of locusts, illustrative of a human foe, has invaded my land. I remember this also is in the book of Ezekiel, is it? about in the book of Ezekiel, I think, because Ezekiel uses a lot of similes. I can't remember which king was described as the locust as well. Is it Cyrus? I can't remember. Mighty and without number. Its teeth are the teeth of lion and it has the jaw teeth of a lioness. It has laid waste my vine, symbol of Elohim's people, and backed and broken my fig tree. It has made them completely bare and thrown them down. The branches are made white. Lament like a virgin bride, girded with sackcloth for the husband of a youth who has died. The meal or cereal offering and the drink offering are cut off from the house of Yahuwah. The priests, Yahuwah's ministers, mourn. The field is laid waste, so we know it's the desolation of Israel here. The ground mourns, for the grain is destroyed. The new juice of the grape is dried up, the oils fails. Be ashamed, O you tillers of the soil. Wail, O you vine dresses, for the wheat and for the barley, because the harvest of the field has perished. The vine is dried up and the fig tree fails. The pomegranate tree, the palm tree also, and the apple or quince tree, even all the trees of the field are withered so that joy has withered and fled away from the sons of men. Gird yourselves and lament, you priests. Wail, you ministers of the altar. Lie all night in sackcloth, 
you ministers of my Joel's Elohim, for a cereal or meal offering and a drink offering are withheld with from the house of your Elohim. Sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the elders and the inhabitants of the land in the house of Yahuwah, your Elohim, and cry to Yahuwah in penitent pleadings, alas, for the day, for the day of judgment of Yahuwah is at hand, and the destructive tempest from the Almighty will it come. Is not the food cut off before our eyes, joy and gladness from the house of our Elohim? The scene good rots and shrivels under the clods. The garners are desolate and empty. The barns are in ruins because the grain has failed. How the beasts groan. The herds of cattle are perplexed and huddled together because they have no pasture. Even the flocks of sheep suffer punishment, are forsaken and made wretched. So we see here in this chapter that Israel, Israel, we know that Israel and Judah, the fall of Israel and Judah becoming a divided nation. And we are now going to see what is going to happen. Oh, I know I was reading the wrong chapter. <laughs> Joel 3. But anyway, it was still good to know the fall of Israel and Judah. Joel 3. I'm so sorry about that. For behold, in those days and at that time when I shall reverse the captivity. So we see the fall. But we remember we said that the prophets and the apostles were waiting on the restoration of Israel. Because I'm going somewhere with this. We, we have seen, perhaps I can just mention it now to touch on it. We have learned in Christianity that the church has replaced Israel. It's called replacement theology. And we saw that with um, Lacunza. Is it his name? What was his name again? Manuel de Lacunza, I think was his name. Manuel de Lacunza, who started the rapture doctrine, where he talked about it's the bishops that will be in the wilderness that will be kept safe. And then the people will be restored to the church. And then he talked about those who take the mark of the beast, that they will have a time of redemption and being restored to the church. So there is this ideology and belief out there, which is from the enemy, that the church has replaced Israel, not understanding. And we're going to get to this. I know I'm getting ahead of myself, but I'm saying this so that we can understand what we're going to read now. What happens when the saints are caught up. So that's what we are on now. We've met Yahusha in the air. He comes to reign as king. And then he comes now to the valley of Jehoshaphat, which is what we're going to read about now. Um, it's important to understand that there is the olive tree, which is Israel, right? And I'm not going to dwell on this long because we're going to cover it later, but I want us to read it with context. And Gentiles that are grafted in, they're not grafted into, even if they have inserted the word number one church there in the scriptures, it was called in Hebrew, it's the call out assembly. So they grafted into the assembly of the saints. You remember even in the Torah, the children of Israel were referred to as saints. Even in the Torah, even David himself, the psalmist, write about the saints. So this is not something new to be called saints. A lot of people think to be called saints is something that came with Yahusha. It is not something new. Hallelujah. Right? So... Thank you, Christy Johnson. It's Nebuchadnezzar. I know it was referring to some king. I couldn't get which one with the locusts. Thank you. So we see that um, we see that when the Gentiles are grafted in, Yahusha came from the line of Judah. So they grafted into that line. It is not a replacement theology where the church is separate because the rapture doctrine teaches that the church is raptured and then Elohim deals with Israel. That's not what happens in scripture. And we're going to see that as well. So I just wanted to set that context because remember in the book of Romans where it talks about those that are grafted in, don't puff yourself up against the natural olive tree. You are good. We are good. Those, those that are Gentiles are grafted in to the olive tree. Israel is still considered Israel in Yahuwah's eyes. He's the same Elohim yesterday, today, and forever. And it does not change. We have to remember that. Regardless of what we are taught, he's the same Elohim yesterday, today, and forever. And he does not change. Israel was Israel then. The prophets all prophesied for the restoration of Israel. This is what happens when Yahusha returns, the restoration of Israel. But what is Israel now? Because now it's a renewed covenant. The King James has inverted, inserted the word new. But when you read it from Hebrew, from the Hebrew scriptures, like the BYNV, Right, that, that translated directly. I don't know if I can get it here. 
translated directly from Hebrew to English, tells you renewed. The Sefer tells you it's a renewed covenant because the covenant is still the same. It's not a different covenant. The Torah is just written on our hearts. It's a renewed covenant. So they grafted into Israel. We want to establish that. So when, you, when the scripture talks about the restoration of Israel, the church is not something separate, right? They grafted in. The Gentiles grafted in. So let's continue. Joel 3. That's the scripture I read by mistake, Joel 1. So when I shall reverse the captivity, so all that they have done to Israel in the past, and this is not somebody challenged me last week and saying I'm racist, and I had to rebuke them and tell them I don't receive that. I try to walk in the love of Mashiach. I'm only reading scripture. This is what scripture says. Whatever they have done, this is Yahuwah's doing. I didn't write this. He's going to reverse it. I will reverse the captivity and restore the fortunes of, oh, I'm not sharing my screen, of Judah and Jerusalem. I will gather all nations and bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat. And there I will deal with and execute judgment upon them for their treatment of my people and of my heritage, Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations and because they have divided my land. If you missed the 1948 series, the deception, the, I can't remember the title of it, um, the 1948 deception, that series was very deep. We established by the end of that series the fulfillment of the prophecy that Yahusha himself spoke in the book of Luke that Jerusalem is being trodden down by the Gentiles. They have divided his land and the land is being shredded down by the Gentiles, as the prophecy has stated. And they have cast lots for my people, and have given a boy for a harlot, and sold a girl for juice out of the grape, and have drunk it. Yes, and what are you to me, O Tyre and Sidon, and all the five small divisions of Philistia? Will you pay me back for something? Even if you pay me back swiftly and speedily, I will return your deed of retaliation upon your own head, because you have taken my silver and my gold, and I've carried into your temples and palaces my precious treasures. And I've sold the children of Judah. Well, if you follow the Ezekiel 28 series, when we talked about the cherubim, we talked about this, the king of Tyre. We went deep into that as well. And have sold the children of Judah and the children of Jerusalem to the sons of the Grecians, the Greeks, that you may remove them far from their border. Behold, I will stir them out of the place to which you have sold them that slavery, and will return your deed of retaliation upon your own head. I will sell. I am not saying this. This is talking about when Elohim, when Yahusha returns. He gathers the nations to the valley of Joseph, Jehoshaphat, and there is going to be a time of judgment. But he doesn't kill everyone. It's important to understand that because he, he's not like he's here on earth with the saints ruling, and he's only the saints on earth. But he is judged. We don't know who will be judged and who will be allowed to live. That's he is judge. Hallelujah. He is judge. But there is a judgment, an initial judgment. But this is not the same judgment as the day of judgment after the second resurrection. This is a different one. So he says here. What verse am I on? Behold, I will stir them, verse 7, out of the place to which you have sold them and will return your deed of retaliation upon your own head. I will sell your sons and your daughters into the hand of the children of Judah, and they will sell them to the Sabaeans, to a nation far off, for Yahuwah has spoken it. Proclaim this among the nations. Prepare war. Stir up the mighty men. This is war. But he has already won. Hallelujah. Let all the men of war draw near. Let them come up. Beat your plowshares into swords. Come up. That means he's already somewhere else, isn't he? Let them come up. He's already there. He's already on that mount. Let them come up. That's why it says, Yahushua himself shall descend from heaven. He's descending to come on the earth. Hallelujah. Let them come up. Beat your plowshares into swords. Come with your weapons and your pruning hooks into spares. Let the weak say, I am strong, a warrior. Hasten and come, all you nations round about, and assemble yourselves there. For there, there, sorry, and assemble yourselves there, you, O Yahuwah, 
will bring down your mighty ones, your warriors. Let the nations bestow themselves and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat. For there will I sit to judge all the nations round about. The government will be upon his shoulders, saints. When he comes, he's establishing his rule. He's establishing his rule when he comes. The government upon his shoulders. There will be a judgment taking place in the valley of Jehoshaphat. And the laws, oh, all the laws are going to change. All these ungodly laws will be done and over, over with. Hallelujah. Put in the sickle for the vintage harvest is ripe. Come, get down and shred the grapes. Remember we read about the sickle in one of our, I can't remember which book talks about the sickle. Sickle, is it Mark? Put in the sickle for the vintage harvest is ripe. Come, get down and shred the grapes for the wine press is full. The vats overflow. For the wickedness of the people is great. Multitudes. Multitudes in the valley of decision. That is the valley of judgment when he returns. For the day of Yahuwah is near in the valley of decision. It means the time is coming. The sun and the moon are darkened. And the stars withdraw their shining. Yahuwah will thunder and roar from Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem. And the heavens and the earth shall quake. But Yahuwah will be a refuge for his people and a stronghold to the children of Israel. So shall you know, understand and realize that I am Yahuwah, your Elohim, dwelling in Zion, my holy mountain. Then shall Jerusalem be holy. So he's establishing his rule and establishing holiness in Jerusalem. And that is why, do not listen to you, the United Nations. And you see, they're saying, oh, um, the minister of defense, the secretary of state is now in France or is now in the UK to discuss peace and um, agreement with what's going on in the Middle East. It's really sad what's going on. It's really terrible what's going on. But saints, there will be no peace in Jerusalem till Yahusha returns. If you see the video we did, what it means to pray for the peace of Jerusalem, we go through the scriptures. Only when Yahusha returns, there will be peace, shalom, no crying no more, holiness in Jerusalem. Hallelujah. Because even when they will have the Antichrist and say peace and safety, a sudden destruction. Hallelujah. So we stop on this verse. And in that day, the mountain shall drip with fresh juice of grape. Oh, sorry. So shall you know and understand. I read this. Then shall Jerusalem be holy and strangers and foreigners not born into the family of Elohim shall no more pass through it. So the strangers and for those who have not accepted Yahuwah, have not accepted Yahusha Mashiach as the Adonai and Savior, cannot anymore pass in Jerusalem. The Gentiles can no longer tread Jerusalem. Christy Johnson says, slavery is still so bad in the Asian nations and Middle East. Very, very true. And I even saw on CNN documentary um, with people who are, there's still this secret slavery going on where they have people as slaves in their homes and um, they're not allowed to go out or shop or do anything, you know, for the elites. So it's still something that is prevalent, even though they say it's abolished. It is still something that is prevalent. Thank you for sharing. And in that day, the mountain shall drip with fresh juice of the grape and the hills shall flow with milk and all the brooks and riverbeds of Judah shall flow with water and a fountain shall come forth from the house of Yahuwah and shall water the valley of Shittim. Hallelujah. So restoration. The mountains drip with fresh juice. It means restoration. The hills flow with, with milk. Restoration. The books and river jet, riverbeds of Judah flow with water and a fountain shall come forth from the house of Yahuwah. We read about that also in Revelation. That fountain, that fountain, that river that will flow again in Israel. So we've read here about the, the war in the valley of Jehoshaphat. When Yahusha returns, he's returning to war. Let me just read this quickly because it, it was popped into my spirit. Psalm, we may have we, we may have to cover the other parts in another session. Psalm 149. Because this psalm is actually about Yahusha. I think, I hope this is a psalm. So let's read this psalm. Praise Yahuwah. Sing to Yahuwah a new song. 
Praise him in the assembly of his saints. You know, they have certain things just now. Oh, my mouse needs to charge. Just a second. There are certain things that I love and prefer to read in my sefer. So let's go to Psalms 149. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So whenever you say hallelujah, you actually say in the name of Yah in your mouth. It means praise Yahuwah. Hallelujah. Praise Yah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Sing unto Yahuwah a new song. And it's praise in the assembly of the Kassid. Hallelujah. I think Kassid means his saints. Let Yasharel rejoice in him that made him. Let the children of Zion be joyful in their king. Because Yahusha will be coming to reign as king. Let them praise his name in the dance. You will see it. And let them sing praises unto him with the timbrel and harp. For Yahuwah takes pleasure in his people. He will beautify the meek with Yeshua. Let the Kassid be joyful in glory, the saints. Let them sing aloud upon their beds. Let the high praises of ale be in their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hand, right? To execute vengeance upon the heathen and punishments upon the, the people to bind their kings with chains and their nobles with fetters of iron to execute upon them the judgment written. This honor have all his sins. Hallelujah. And that's why I was saying this psalm is actually about when Yahusha comes and reign as king. And we also read in, revolution, in, Revel, in Revelations that the, the saints will be taking part in, the, in giving that judgment. Hallelujah. That is not the day of judgment that belongs to Yahuwah. That is a different time. That is a different event. This is when Yahusha returns. Bind the kings with chains and the nobles with fetters of iron. The tables will turn. I am not saying this. This is what is prophesied in scripture. To execute upon them the judgment written. So Yahusha gives the judgment, the saints execute. This honor have all the sin. This has not happened yet. And this is not, uh, you know, some people think the Psalms is poetry. It's truth. It is truth. All scripture is inspiration from Elohim. So what happens when the saints are caught up? I think we'll end on this slide. And then when we return, because we have a lot to cover, there are certain things that happens when the saints are caught up and meet Yahusha. So I will show you the events that we will cover the next time because it's really important. I don't think we should watch through this. It is really important to get this. So we have here now, in it talks about the sickle. We read about that sickle when we read the book of Joel. And we're going to read in Mark 4, an alignment in Mark 4. I believe I, this is what it says. The alignment in Mark 4, 26 to 29. It says, Let me see if I can share the screen. It says, and he said, the kingdom of Elohim, you have the right one, yes, is like a man who scatters upon the ground, seed upon the ground, and then continues sleeping. And rising night and day, while the seed sprouts and grows and increases, he knows not how. The earth produces, acting by itself, first the blade, then the air, then the full grain in the air. So that's growth. But when the grain is ripe and permits, immediately he sends forth the reapers, puts in the sickle, because the harvest stands ready. And he said, with what can we compare the kingdom of Elohim, or what parable shall we use to illustrate and explain it? So he was trying to get them to see. He used all sorts of different parables to try to illustrate the kingdom of Elohim, what it is. And this time, this time when Yahusha shall come. So we read about Joel at, about the time of the sickle. When the grain is ripe and permits, immediately he sends forth his reapers and puts in the sickle because the harvest stands ready. Hallelujah. The harvest stands ready. There is a day allotted when the number of the Gentiles is fulfilled. 
when that number is fulfilled, the harvest is ready, then Yahusha will return. Now, hallelujah, I see a big hallelujah, hallelujah, the name of Yahuwah in his mouth. Remember what he said to the church of Philadelphia, you have not renounced or denied my name. And that's why it's something that the enemy has robbed us of when we came into the Christian faith. He has robbed us off. But Elohim is right now putting his name back in the mouths of his saints, making it known. Hallelujah. So what else is going to happen when Yahusha returns? So we're going to cover these last two points, the beast and the false prophet. Because when he returns, this is very important to know, because remember, it is not the rapture that we've been taught. My light just went off. If you see that I've gotten a little dull. It is not the rapture, the rapture that we've been taught. So now let's look at Revelation chapter 19. When Yahusha returns, what happens? What else happens when he returns? And I saw the heaven opened, and behold, a white horse appeared. The one who was riding it is called faithful, trustworthy, loyal, incorruptible, steady, and true. And he passes judgment and wages war in righteousness, holiness, justice, and uprightness. Right? He saw heaven open. The white horse appeared. We know it's Yahusha returning. His eyes blaze like a flame of fire, and on his head are many kingly crowns, diadems, and he has a title, a name inscribed, which he alone knows or can understand. He is dressed in a robe dyed by dipping in blood, and the title by which he is called is the Word of Yahuwah. And the troops of heaven, clothed in fine linen, dazzling and clean, followed him on white horses. So we're seeing his return here and he's describing his vesture. He has a different vesture. What does it mean his robe dipped in blood? He's coming for war. His time when he came to be sacrificed, to lay his life down, hallelujah, that time came and passed. And just what we read about in the book of Joel, the war in the valley of Jehoshaphat, multitudes, it says, multitudes in the valley of Jehoshaphat. We're not hearing this being talked about in the church. In most churches, I should say. Multitudes. Multitudes in the valley of Jehoshaphat. The enemy is trying to get people to believe in a false doctrine. So they will have a false expectation. There is no rapture, secret rapture into heaven. Go and reign and live in heaven. The earth has it given to the children of men. We will not be raptured and taken out of here. But we have no need to fear because if we build up our faith, pray, it says, that he be counted worthy to escape the things that shall come to pass. Pray, as he, as he says, even in Revelation chapter 3, we saw that I will keep you safe because you have not denied my name, renounced my name. You've kept the patience. You've guarded my word. I will keep you safe in the hour of testing, the hour of trial that shall come upon the whole world. We all will be here for the great tribulation. Some will be kept safe in the sense where they will be allowed to go into the wilderness for three and a one half years. That is the safety. Some will be kept safe. Those that through the characteristics in their walk with Yah, the characteristics of their walk with Yah will fit that category to be chosen as those that he will keep safe from the hour of his testing. Hallelujah. Some will be out there when the enemy goes back to make war with the rest. When he see he cannot harm those in the wilderness, he goes back to make war with those who keep the commandments of Elohim and have the testimony of Yahusha HaMashiach. This is what scripture says. So when he is returning, he's not returning like they show us in movies. Clove, white, and angels all in white, and, and he himself, he himself, his attire is different. His attire, he's dressed in a robe, dipped in blood, and the title by which he is called is the word of Yahuwah. He's coming on a different mission. Now he's coming to establish rule. Now he's coming for war. Is he's already won. It's not like he'll be fighting like you're watching movies. There will be war, meaning that they gather for war. The intent of mankind's heart, the heart of mankind that will be evil, their intent 
is that they will gather for war. So when he, when he goes on the mount and he establishes himself there and he tells them, come, go get your beat your plowshares into spares and come, come to the valley of Jehoshaphat, come for the war. They will be actually coming to their judgment and to their death. So he comes with his robe dipped in blood. This is scripture. And the troops of heaven clothed in fine linen. The troops will be clothed in linen. The troops will be clothed in white. Hallelujah. The white horses they will be on. But he himself, his robe is dripped in blood. His robe will be red in color, blood in color. From his mouth goes forth a sharp sword with which he can smite, afflict, strike the nations, which we know is his word. And he will shepherd and control them with a staff. And he will shepherd and control them with a staff, a scepter, a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath and indignation of Yahuwah, the all ruler, the almighty, the omnipotent. Hallelujah. The omnipotent. And his garment is robe and on his thigh his name, a title inscribed, King of Kings and Adonai Ha. Adonim, king of kings. That is why I was saying when he was here on earth, he was not yet walking in his office of king of kings. He came as that lamb to be slain, to lay his life down. Hallelujah. To take it back up again. Hallelujah. Glory to Elohim for the gift of everlasting life. Thank you, Father, for the gift of everlasting life. I give you praise and I give you glory. We give you honor. We magnify your holy name. And when he comes again, he's coming now to walk and fulfill the office of king of kings. He is the king of kings. Don't get me wrong. But I mean the demonstration and the establishment of his rule here on the earth. Then I saw a single agent, angel stationed in the sun's light. And with a mighty voice, he shouted to all the birds that fly across the sky, come. Gather yourselves together for the great supper of Yahuwah, that you may feast on the flesh of rulers, the flesh of generals and captains. Since do you see this when I told you the psalm? That was Elohim putting that psalm in my spirit. Psalm 149. Do you see the line here? Bind their feet with chains and with their bind themselves with chains and their feet with fetters of iron or something of that sort. Do you see it here? It aligns. This is the psalmist, David, since then, having the revelation. The psalms are not poetry for us to read and enjoy. The psalms are truth. When it's a, These are prayers and songs of worship. They are truth. So he said he calls the birds, as we saw when we read in the book of Matthew. And look, come, that you may feast on the flesh of rulers, the flesh of generals and captains, the flesh of powerful and mighty men, the flesh of horses and their riders, and the flesh of all humanity, both free and slave, both small and great. Hallelujah. Then I saw the beast, so the Antichrist. This is the very beast we saw, but we read in Revelation chapter 13. Where for the elect's sake, when it says the times will be shortened, the day will be shortened, it means that the time, the rain, that he's allowed to have to overpower the saints will be a short span of time. Now that beast that promised the whole world, all whose names are not written in the book of life, take the mark of the beast and life will be great. Life will be all right. You can buy and sell. You, you know, you can have the life. You can have it all. Look at his end. Then I saw the beast. And the rulers and leaders of the earth with their troops mustered to go into battle and make war against him who is mounted on the horse and against his troops. To make war against him, capital H. This is Yahusha. Yahusha comes down. He comes down. Hallelujah. We are not being, being escaped and taken into heaven. He comes back to reign on the earth. And the beast was seized and overpowered. And with him, the false prophet, who in his presence, which you read about in Revelation chapter 13, had worked wonders and performed miracles by which he led astray those who had accepted or permitted to be placed upon them the stamp, the mark of the beast, and those who paid homage and gave divine honors to his statue, 
Both of them were hurled alive into the fiery lake that burns and blazes with brimstone. This is the end of the beast, which is the Antichrist and his false prophet. These two will be reigning on earth during that time when they are allowed to overpower the saints. And the, anti, the false prophet will be performing miracles in the presence of the Antichrist. And we read this very thing. This aligns with Revelation chapter 13. This is scripture. And hence the reason why I said, we're concluding here. One more point and we're concluding after this. Here's the reason why I said that. Um, what was I going to say? Um, bring it back to me, Father. Uh, what was I going to say? As I say, we're concluding. I lose my trend of thought. But this would be the end of the beast and the Antichrist. Yes, this is what I wanted to say. Thank you, Father. What I wanted to say was we have to be wary now that when they say revival, miracles happening over there, miracles happening over there, do not go and run. We need discernment because the false prophet will be working wonders and performing miracles in the presence of the Antichrist, right? Who has power given to him by the dragon. Bear that in mind for the times that will be coming upon this earth. The, the, the scripture talks about the falling away. There will be a falling away, not a revival. But the signs that they will be doing are line signs and line wonders. They will be thrown, they will be hurled alive into the fiery lake that burns and blazes with brimstone. I think I read in the book of Enoch a long time ago. Um, I have to find it or I read it somewhere. I can't remember which book. I'll have to try to see if I can find it for next week. It talks about when Yahusha returns that the lake of fire, I don't know how, but I remember the earth is huge. Don't ask me how, this is just what's written. But apparently it becomes visible. So I don't know if it's part of it or what, but it becomes visible. So they will actually be thrown. This is not like a story account. They will be thrown into the lake of fire. It's not like they will be killed with a sword and the dead body on earth and then they get burned and then the soul goes to hell. No. These will be thrown alive for the evil and wickedness that they wrath upon the earth. Their judgment will be that they will be hurled alive. I believe scripture. I am not going to question scripture. They will be hurled alive into the fiery lake that burns and blazes with brimstone. And the rest were killed with the sword. Because remember, they came for war. Killed with the sword that issues from the mouth of him who is mounted on the horse. And all the birds feed ravenously and glutton themselves with their flesh. The birds will be feasting. They will be feasting. They will be having a great, great, great feast on the flesh of the kings and the princes and all those wicked rulers. They will be feasting on them. We will look at this verse in Revelation 14. Um, okay, so... Let us go to the last point. I'm trying to see why I had this verse, Revelation 14. The beast and the false prophet thrown into the lake of fire. So I had that point. And I have Revelation 14. Again, I looked and behold, I saw a white cloud and sitting on the cloud, one resembling the son of man, or to support the scripture we just read, with a crown of gold upon his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. And another angel came out of the temple sanctuary, calling with a mighty voice to him, who was sitting upon the cloud, put in your skith and reap, for the hour has arrived to gather the harvest, the, for the earth's crop is fully ripened. So he who was sitting upon the cloud swung his sickle on the earth, and the earth's crop was harvested. And then another angel came out of the temple in heaven, and he also carried a sickle. And another angel came forth from the altar who has authority and power over fire, and he called forth with a loud cry to him who had the sharp sickle, Put forth your skid sickle and reap the footage of the vine of the earth, for its grapes are entirely ripe. So the angel swung his sickle in the earth and stripped the grapes and gathered the vintage from the vines of the earth and cast it into the huge wine press of Elohim's indignation and wrath. The huge wine press of his wrath. So that's the gathering of those who are not in Yahusha 
who refuse the righteousness of Elohim. These will be judged. These will have experiences wrath and indignation. We are not appointed unto wrath. Sister Elian said, I didn't know what you've just spoken, Melissa. You've put in bite able sizes to understand. Thank you so much, Sister Elian. It's a blessing to get the feedback. I praise Elohim, all the glory. So this is the last point we're going to deal with. Satan is born. What happens when Yahusha returns? What happens when the saints are caught up? We meet him in the air. He comes, right? And we see that he comes. All we'll see is not a secret. There's war in the valley of Jeho Jehoshaphat. There's judgment happening, in other words. All different kinds of judgment. We have war in the valley of Jeho Jehoshaphat. We have the beast and the, sorry, I wanted to take everything out. We have the beast and the false prophet thrown into the lake of fire, alive. Believe scripture. No question it. Alive. But we also have something else that happens when Yahusha returns. And we'll cover this last point. Satan is bound for a thousand years. The adversary, our adversary, hallelujah, will be bound. Will be bound. His judgment is already set. It was already spoken in the book of John before Yahusha ascended. The judge, he said the sentence was passed. Hallelujah. The sentence was passed. He isn't living out the sentence yet. But the sentence was passed. And now execution has come. So Revelation chapter 20. And that's not even the end yet. When Yahusha returns. So when you read in chapter 19, right? In chapter 19, it tells you about his return. Remember we read that? In chapter 19, he has his robe dipped in blood. And he comes and he makes war with the kings of the earth. All right. He makes war and he kills the kings of the earth and calls the eagles and the birds to come and feast on them. Right. So now in 20, we know that he's already here. That's why I say you can't read scripture in isolation. In 20, Yahushua is already on earth. Then I saw an angel descending from heaven. He was holding the key of the abyss, the bottomless pit. And a great chain was in his hand. There is a bottomless pit. If scripture says it, it's there. We don't know any everything and we have to accept that. The problem with many people is that they can't accept that we don't know everything. Look like tonight. I think I got myself mixed up in the beginning of the session. I need to go that over to see how I mixed up with the two slides there. So I'm going to look that over to see what happened. We make mistakes. We don't know everything. And we have to accept that. And that is humility. We, some people, and especially with scientists, that's why they are scientists and they're atheists, because they want to know everything. And if I, if I don't know and understand that this is exactly this, then that's not true. Then that doesn't make sense. You know, but Elohim is the creator over heaven and the earth. All rule, all power belong unto him. And oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, he still sits on the throne. And we can never fathom. Who can comprehend him? Who can search him out? When we study his word, he gives us a measure of understanding. Hallelujah. He gives the measure of understanding by his Holy Spirit. He does it. Hallelujah. He does it. He gives us that measure of wisdom. But still, we can never search him out. Even though you and I can see when we started today, 10 years ago, we were not this stage. 20 years ago, and we could see the growth in him. Still, it's still a measure. Hallelujah. So we're dealing with this last point and we shall close. I thank you so much for sticking with me and I wasn't talking to myself tonight. Thank you so much. Hallelujah. Christy Johnson says, all I have needed, thy hand have provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Elohim, unto me. Hallelujah. Great is your faithfulness. He's faithful. Never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread saints. Let us stand on his word and believe it. He is faithful. He is faithful. Don't think about tomorrow. He said sufficient is the evil of the day thereof. Don't think about, oh, when are they going to bring the mark of the beast? How am I going to live? What about my children? Sufficient is the evil of the day thereof. Cast your cares upon him. Make a petition to him. Earnestly in your heart. Set your affection on things above. We played a clip when we started, and I'll not talk too long. I'm ending now. We played a clip when we started today, tonight, of this great shepherd that's saying, you have, you, what I wrote it down, you cannot be so heavenly minded 
that you know earthly good. That is rubbish, all due respect. It is rubbish. You cannot be heavenly, so heavenly minded that you know earthly good. That is rubbish. That is sayings of the world. That is sayings of the world. The scripture says in Colossians, in Corinthians, and we could find it throughout, set your affections on things above. Our affection is for the heavenly things. Our desire is for the heavenly things. Walk in the spirit. The Holy Spirit, the spirit of Elohim, the ruach of Elohim. Walk in the spirit. You cannot be over spiritual. Yahusha walked in the fullness of the Holy Spirit. He walked in the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. And we are asked to walk in the spirit so we do not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So there's no such thing as overly spiritual or too heavenly minded. Our eyes, the king, our eyes is on the kingdom. Seek first the kingdom of Elohim. Seek first the kingdom of Elohim. I see here from Niguana saying, thank you for your work, sister. Few are in the word. Too much conjecture and self-aggrandizement, wanting to be prophets and chosen. May you bless this ministry of digging in the word. Peace to all. Thank you for saying that. And you know, that is such a true thing. A lot of people just want titles. Prophet so-and-so. Prophetess so-and-so. We don't need the titles. We are already have our title. We are saints. Do we understand the value of being called a saint, a child of Elohim? There was no easy price that was paid for your soul and my soul. I remember years ago hearing Paula White and another pastor saying, oh, that they could have done what Yahu anyone could have done what Yahusha did. And I'm like, Father, what are they saying? Back then I was dumb, but now when I heard it being played, we played, you know, sometimes we were watching something and somebody had that inserted. I'm like, what are they saying? What are they saying? That is so wrong. A hefty price was paid. Was paid for our life. That we can be called children of the light. Children of Elohim. Now let me close here. We were closing on Satan being bound for a thousand years. I think it's the best way to close. This is one of the things that happens when Yahusha returns. Then I saw an angel descending from heaven. He was holding the keys of the abyss, the bottomless pit, and a great chain was in his hand. And he gripped and overpowered the dragon. That old serpent of primeval times, who is the devil and Satan, and securely bound him for a thousand years. Then he hurled him into the abyss, the bottomless pit, and closed it and sealed it above him that he should no longer lead astray and de de deceive and seduce the nations until the thousand years were at an end. After that, he must be liberated for a short time. Now, do you see why I told you that it's two events, Yahusha's coming and the final day of judgment afterwards? Now you can see why I say it. It's two different events, right? So when Yahusha returns, war in the valley of Jehoshaphat, judgment in the valley of Jehoshaphat, feed on the flesh of kings and the, and the, the princes, etc. But remember I said, not everybody dies. Not everybody in the whole world dies. No. No, because he is establishing his rule upon the earth. So the dragon now is bounded for a thousand years and that bottomless pit is sealed. He's in chains and he's sealed for a thousand years. What does that thousand years correspond with? The same thousand years that the saints live with the Messiah upon earth. Here, while he's reigning. But it's not like you live with a thousand years and then it ends. Why some people can't believe this? Which I'm, these are things I've heard that I'm sharing. Some people can't believe this because they don't understand it's a thousand years and forever. We read earlier tonight where it said we will be with him in Thessalonians for all eternities. It's forever. It doesn't like end. It's, this is just a time frame that is, it's talking about for his rule on the earth. With before the time of the final day of judgment. So, so he would be sealed, that he should no longer lead us through and deceive and seduce the nations. That is why I said there would be people until the thousand years were at an end. After that, he must be liberated for a short time. Then I saw thrones and sitting on them were those to whom authority to act as judges and to pass sentence was entrusted. 
Remember we saw in Psalm 149, the honor have all the saints, the past judgment. Psalm 149, you see in this hair. Also, I saw the souls of those who had been slain with axes, beheaded for their witnessing to Yahusha and for preaching and testifying the word of Yahuwah. So remember I said um, in Revelations 13, Revelations 12, first of all, when he cannot harm those that are safe in the wilderness, those that Yahusha keeps safe from the hour of testing, when he cannot harm them who are safe, he goes after those, the remnant who keep the testimony of, El, of who keep the commandments of Elohim and have the testimony of Yahusha HaMashiach. Some will be slain because they are appointed to be martyrs. But the blood of the martyrs we read in the scriptures is precious to Yahuwah. So for preaching and testifying the word of Yahuwah. So in other words, in that time, the saints are not going to be scared. It's not like the saints will be, oh, they know the Elohim. We know our Elohim. We have to know our Elohim. That's why they will be beheaded. They will witness, they witnessed his name. They witnessed Yahusha Mashiach. They witnessed everlasting life. They witnessed the gospel. Meaning preach the gospel, share the gospel, spread the gospel. Still, still, and be killed for it. Who had refused to pay homage to the beast or his statue and had not accepted all his mark or permitted it to be stamped on their foreheads or on their hands. And they lived again and ruled with Mashiach a thousand years. So the very same thousand years when Yahusha comes to establish his reign on earth as king of kings on earth, he'll be reigning for a thousand years. We see up here in Revelation chapter 20 verse 2. That the enemy also is bounded for that time, throughout that time. Hallelujah. Thank you, Bob Smith, for sharing. I will definitely see your comments afterwards. Since we're tying up now. Um, and then we finish off here. The remainder of the dead were not restored to life again until the thousand years were completed. After the thousand years, this is the first resurrection. So those who resurrected when Yahusha came. That is the first resurrection. Those that are caught up, caught up to meet him in the air. People just go further. Even I thought it. Go further and say, well, we meet him in the air, so we go to heaven. No. That's why we cannot read scripture in isolation. We went through the scriptures to show you. We meet him in the air, but then he comes to Jerusalem. He comes to Jerusalem. War in the valley of Jehoshaphat. The kings, the birds feeding on their flesh, reversing the captivity. Hallelujah. So we're going to just close this off here. So then Satan now, when the thousand years are completed, Satan will be released from his confinement, his prison. He'll be jailed, saints. You, you know, he, can, he will be jailed. Hallelujah. I can't, I can't scream too loud. It's 1.48 a.m. here. I cannot scream too loud. I'll wake up everybody. If I could scream hallelujah so loud. And he will go forth to deceive and seduce and lead astray the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to muster them for war. Their numbers is like the sand of the sea. So even in the rain, during that thousand year rain, man's heart is hardened. Hardened. Remember we read about it in the days of Noah, in the book of Jasher, where it gave us more insight than Genesis. And it told us that when the waters start to come upon the earth, they start to cry out to Noah, let us come into the ark. And he said, because of their wickedness. But before that, they talk about the seven days when it had the sun darkened, the earthquake, and rain was already falling. They, they, had, they still they didn't repent of their evil. Before that, they did not repent of their evil. Their heart hardened so much that even after Yahusha has established holiness upon the earth, holiness in Jerusalem, righteousness reigning, that when the enemy is out, and this is the power of the deception, I give no praise to him, but those that are evil and that are not Yahushas will submit because the spirit of the disobedient one is working in them. So anyway, let us close it off. I actually supposed to stop on verse number six <laughs> because we cover this later. So I'll end it here. I'll just end it here with the, with the war. Because I think we cover this actually later as well. I don't want to go ahead. So, but he comes out when he's released for after the thousand years. He comes out and he gathers. That's why I said there are two wars, as you can see. 
there's a valley of Jehoshaphat. Come up with your weapons. Come up. And then there is the war with Gog and Magog. After the 1,000 years, when the enemy is released, he goes and he seduces and deceives. He knows the truth. That is why he's deceiving. Deceive and lead astray. So they'll be enticed. They'll be seduced, however he'll be doing it, to lead them astray, to think, okay, after all this time, you'll see Yahusha's reign. Um, Yahusha's reign upon the earth. You all still think you can go and muster war against him? It's a deception. Sister Elaine says, excellent Bible study. I understand a lot more Thanks, Hallelujah. Praise Elohim. Hallelujah, Sister Elaine. So this is what we're going to cover when we come the next time. Like I shared with you, when I started, I'll say this last thing. I'll tell you what we're going to cover and we'll close. When I started the Bible study last week, Friday, um, I struggled because I was thinking to put it all in an hour and like it wasn't flowing. And like, I know the different things I'm reading, but I didn't know how to put a presentation together. I didn't know how to do anything. And it was only until this morning I went down flat. I said, Father, I need your help. I had only done up to the research on Manuel de la Cunza, you know, and some of the scriptures. Father, I really need your help. I just don't know how to do this. Guide me by your Ruach HaKadosh. And you know what? Elohim whispered in my spirit. And this is Elaine to confirm what Sister Elaine said later. Don't wash the word. Elohim put into my spirit. You see the intent? When we, his, our intent is important. I had the wrong intent. Yes, I want to, by his grace, study the word. But the time factor was wrong to put a time factor on it. And I submitted to him on the floor this morning. And in my spirit, he said to me, you just put together what I give you. Put it together. And even if you have to do it in two parts, you put everything, your Bible study, put the Bible study together. So this is what we have done. Tonight, we've gone through the Bible study, right? Hallelujah. When we come again next week, we are on the part where we talk what happens when Yahushua returns. The saints are caught up and what happens? We went through it. So we're going to cover, he will rebuild Jerusalem. Not me saying it again, saints, scriptures. He will go to the Mount of Olives. There will be a second exodus. Now, I may not have all these things in order. I just want to say this, right? I do not have the order of the times. I'm sharing the prophecies. I just want to make that disclaimer, right? Let me make that disclaimer. I do not know the order of the times. It is not for me to know. I'm just sharing the prophecy. These are things written in scripture that happens when he's here. Hallelujah. So please appreciate that. Please appreciate that. There will be a second ex exodus, like a procession. We'll be going through that. They will all have to swear allegiance to Yahuwah as king. After the 1,000 years, Satan is released and entices the men of the earth for the final war, the day of judgment. The prophecy for the restoration of Israel. Gentiles that are grafted in, we're going to talk more about that, what the grafted in, what the oneness means. Because a lot of people believe in that replacement theology that the church has replaced Israel. What that really means and Yahushua being from the line of Judah, what that really means for those that are grafted in. So that is what we are going to cover the next time. We're going to go deep and we're going to talk about some other things that will be happening here on this very earth when Yahushua comes back, when he descends. First Thessalonians chapter 4. And Yahushua himself shall descend, the scripture says. Hallelujah. So I pray that this has blessed you. I pray that it has blessed you. It's 1.53 a.m. here. I'm, I'm sure it's probably late where you are as well. I thank you for staying with me for all this time. I hope you've enjoyed the word. Like I mentioned, I had a slight mix up in the beginning. So forgive me for that. They call it a faux pas, like a mistake. And I will have to go back to see what my mix up was with, I think it was slide number 20 or 21. I have to check it out and you'll get some clarity. If there's anything that I had in the error there or anything, I will share it with you the next time. I'm not ashamed to say that, right? But um, I believe that everything that I've shared otherwise has been sound doctrine from the scriptures. We've seen from the scripture that there is no rapture, secret rapture into heaven taken away and the wicked remain on the earth. It is a for I'm sure you can see that now. If you can see that now, just type it in the chat if you can see that now. I'm sure that you can see now this is a false deception of the enemy that the church 
will be raptured away, taken away, not be here for the tribulation. That will cause people not to prepare, not to gird their loins and make themselves ready. Nagwana says, can't wait for that day. Nagwana, oh, yo, yo. You echo my prayer. Oh, yo, yo, hallelujah. I join you. I join you. He says, yes, even the house of Israel will be saved in the wilderness and the rebels will not enter the kingdom. We'll be talking about that. And the rebels will not enter. The rebels are those that do not keep his commandments and don't have the testimony of Yahushua Mashiach. And he talks about here the callousness of sin. Bob Smith, you typed a real good lot. So I will definitely check yours after the chat when I get the chance. Um, because it's 1.55 a.m. here. So I have two classes tomorrow with some MBA students. But I want to say, I pray that this has blessed you and that you can see that there will be no rapture. And I pray that if this is new to anyone who has watched, anyone who has fallen on this and you believe the rapture, and maybe like now you're probably feeling like me, how I felt some years ago when my mom said to me, Melita girl, there's no rapture and it broke my heart. But you know what? When my heart was broken because I was sad, because that was my hope. Yes, yes, yes. I was very, very, very young. I went on the floor and prayed. And I prayed to the Father. So if you like me and you believed in this, and tonight this just showed you something totally by the scripture, please go and pray. Please take it to the Father in prayer. I believe tonight what we went through in scripture is truth, is sound doctrine. Hallelujah. Sister Elaine said, yes, it has been a blessing. So I'll let you go. Thank you so much. So next week we won't be doing it on a Thursday because um, our family will be going on a very brief vac vacation from Thursday. So I'm thinking of, I may do this live Sunday night. It might be the only time I might have. So I may do this live Sunday night. And I'll, I'll send out the, um, how do you call it? The, the um, how do you call it in StreamYard? I'm, I think my brain is tired. <laughs> I'll send out, you know, when you set up the meeting, so I'll set up the meeting by um tomorrow so that you can go out early so people could prepare the calendar time in your calendar so you could come join me sunday night and then we can go through this maybe at 10 p.m sunday night i'll look at it 10 9 or 10 p.m maybe 10 p.m because i think we have an appointment with someone else with another beautiful family um sunday night to have a chat with them as well so maybe by 10 p.m um we would have this live and we'll go through the last part of this beautiful 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 see beautiful um message because it's important to stand on truth we want to stand on truth and these are wonderful things to look forward for we've got to look forward to this and when you know the truth you're looking forward for the right thing you're not deceived you in the you will have the right i don't like to call it story but it's like when you have a a, a story if you have a wrong belief you're not you're not you're not in the right role in that story because you have a wrong belief. So you're hoping for something that will never happen. And that's a terrible place to be. Hallelujah. If I don't stop now, saints, I'll just keep going. I'm telling you. You know, now I could understand about this person who um, had died. And when he resurrected, he ministered the whole night <laughs> until next day. I'm sure you can feel it. Sometimes if you don't stop, you could go on and on and on for hours. Because this is our delight. Hallelujah. His word is our delight. Hallelujah. So let me close with a short prayer and then we go. Oh, heavenly father, great and mighty Elohim of Israel, king of all kings. You are sovereign. You are supreme. You reign over all. Heaven is your throne. The earth is your footstool. You are mighty and great and you do mighty things. None can be compared unto you. None can be likened unto you, O Yahuwah. We come together, O Father, with one voice and in one spirit. And we give you praise and we give you glory and honor for this moment that we spent in deep Bible study, studying your word of truth. And we thank you for your Ruach HaKadosh, for your Holy Spirit that you have given unto us freely, Father. And we thank you for cleaning our ears that we may hear. And we thank you for touching our hearts that we may understand. And we thank you for opening our eyes that we may see, O Elohim. And now we pray that the word that has been spoken here tonight will take root in our heart and we will stand on the foundation of truth 
and that we shall not be shaken and that we shall not be enticed. We shall not be swayed or deceived or seduced by any other lying doctrine of the enemy. But thou, O Elohim, who has caused us to walk in the paths of righteousness, who has caused us to walk in the path of truth, shall keep us, O Father, under your wings, under your shadow, in this path of truth, O Elohim, and to serve thee and worship thee in spirit and in truth. We bless your holy name. I pray that you bless everyone that was here tonight. I pray that you bless those who came and couldn't stay, O oh Father. You know of their hearts. You know their lives. You know their, de their needs. You know their petitions. You know their supplications. You are the Elohim that answers prayer. You are the Elohim who is faithful. You never fail. You have never seen the righteous forsaken or his seed begging bread. So may you, Father, look within their lives and be their source of strength. Be their source of help. Be their source of provision. Oh, Elohim, be their God. Be the bishop of their souls. Father, we thank you tonight. We thank you, Father, for the movement of your Holy Spirit. We thank you for the joy in our heart. We declare with our mouth. We profess your holy name. We thank you for the expectation, the hope that you have given each and every one of us that believe in you, that have been grafted in, that is now called sons and daughters of Elohim. Hallelujah. We thank you, Father. We thank you for the privilege, the privilege to be called sons and daughters of Elohim. We thank you for the privilege to be a part of the assembly of the saints. We thank you for the privilege, O oh Father, to be in your kingdom. Blessed be your holy name. Glory to your holy name. Yahuwah se vowed. May you be worshipped forevermore. We declare our expectation, the return of the Messiah to establish his rule and forever we shall be with him. No tears in our eyes, no more sorrow, no more pain. Oh Elohim, no more unrighteousness, no more unholiness, no more abomination, no more oppression. Oh Elohim, you said holiness shall be in Mount Zion. You said holiness, oh Father, shall be proclaimed throughout all of Jerusalem. You said the bells, oh Father, and the horses shall be called holiness is Yahuwah. We give you glory. We give you praise. And we wait patiently for the return of our Messiah. Hallelujah. Blessed be your holy name. Amen. Hallelujah. Bye for now, saints. Blessed be the holy name of Elohim. Be blessed. See you on Sunday. Bye for now. Thank you so much for sticking with me.